Welcome to Corpse Club, the official podcast of DailyDead.com. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jonathan James, and I'm joined today by Brian Christopher, Derek Anderson, and Tamika Jones. Tamika, thanks for uh, for joining us. We're excited to have you back. I'm excited to be back. <laughs> we have missed you, but yeah, we're excited to have you. And of course, Derek and Brian, too, for our episode, where we are going to talk about the return of the drive-in experience in a big way. Um, it's kind of hard to believe we did a drive-in episode last year, and it was us picking our drive-in you know, movie marathons for like, what if we were at the drive-in? And of course I go to some, you know, drive-in marathons from time to time. And, you know, if you've listened to Corpse Club, you know how much I love going to the drive-in, but it was more of like drive-ins are closing around the world. Like if you get a chance, go to the drive-in and now obviously, you know, COVID-19 and, um, you know, there's a lot of terrible things going on in the world, but one of the good things that uh, is happening, at least, there's, there's, I don't know if it's silver lining, but um, one thing we can at least um, enjoy um, while, you know, most of us are, are locked in is the ability to go out and go to the drive-in and see a movie on the big screen. And um, so I think it's been really cool to see the drive-in come back. I, I think for a few reasons, um, you know, I, I think, you know, just off the top of my head, I, I think that one of the, the big ones is that, you know, Owning a drive-in theater is tough. A lot of these people have struggled. A lot of people went out of business because they were forced, essentially, to upgrade to digital projectors if they wanted to show new movies. And that put a lot of drive-ins out of business or gave them financial hardship. And now, drive-ins are packed. Um, you know, not a lot of people are going to irregular theater. And so when you look at, you know, movie totals, you know, there's, there's IFCs releasing a lot of movies. And, you know, and there's a lot of indies coming out. When you see what, the, what their totals are and how well they're doing, their biggest, you know, takes are coming from drive-ins. Um, you know, we have Evil Dead, you know, thanks to Grindhouse, um, you know, releasing is touring around the country. I got to do that in Chicago, and I think that's pretty awesome. So, um, you know, I think it's really cool to see this drive-in experience just come back and, and kind of be bigger than ever when we thought it was going to be gone. Um, so anyway, um, this is going to be, I guess, part, you know, dedicated to, to the, the resurgence of the drive-in, but we're going to, you know, pick our ideal drive-in movie marathon, kind of like we did last year. Obviously we'll have new themes this year. And, um, so we're going to go around the group and I'm going to have everybody kind of intro, just talk about, you know, what your theme is, what's the, the theme of your, your drive-in program. And um, we're going to go around and each person's going to, you know, pick one movie. We'll go around. By the end of it, we're going to have uh, four movies for our, our drive-in program. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, what we did last time is we got a lot of listeners that, that um, emailed in or hit us up on social media and said, hey, you know, I, I you know. I ran your, your drive-in program and, and we had a great time. So uh, hopefully we'll give you some good suggestions and, um, and yeah, and we'll also in between, I'll, I'll interject and we'll talk a little bit about some Halloween setup. We're in the middle of Halloween season. Even if you don't go to the drive-in, you know, you can set up a, a great experience at your home and kind of get ready for Halloween. We'll talk a little bit about that. Some of the setups we have at home and anything else that comes to mind. So um, anyway, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Brian, I'll have you kick us off and um, tell us what your drive-in theme is and tell us what your first movie pick is and, and also kind of set us up for it. You know, why, why did you, why did you pick your first movie? What's the, what's the thought behind it? Maybe it's, you know, more science than art in the case of, you know, I don't know, child's play. It would be, you know, one, two, three, four, or maybe there's an art to it. Maybe there's, like I said, a specific programming in mind based on who's watching, where they're watching, how they're watching. So uh, anyway, I'll let you uh, kind of take it and go from there. All righty. So um, if any, if people are like me right now, uh, your, your brain's probably not working as uh, sophisticatedly as it once did, if it ever did. In my case, I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, but I went with a very basic premise and it's going to be the too good to be true evening at the drive-in. And every time you hear the word two, it's going to be the number two because the whole premise is that this is going to be second installments of uh, horror movie franchises or uh, horror movie series. Um, and oh. yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, 
I think I was very cute with with my premise here and my title, um, but um, almost too cute. Little, I, I just just this side of too cute. Like I think if I pushed it any further, we'd be into uh, precocious. But I think I'm I'm just on this side of cute, and um, the idea here is that uh, I'm not gonna do necessarily the the expect you know the the ones you'd expect you know you're not going to see any of the uh the main slasher franchises in here um it's not going to be totally obscure movies but these are just going to be ones that uh i think are fun uh a, a lot of them tend to be ones that i enjoyed as a kid um and that's actually going to be the case for my number one pick uh which is oh and the other thing is that i also wanted to pick movies that if this is the first time you're seeing a movie from this series, uh, it's not necessarily going to reduce your enjoyment of it if you haven't seen the first one. Um, and so my first movie is going to be a um, uh, kind of a kid-friendly pick since this is going to be a little early in the evening. And we're going to want to go with something that, you know, maybe if uh, the, the younger kids are in the car that they can enjoy it too. And it's going to be Gremlins 2, the new batch. Um, so, you know, anybody who is, uh, familiar, uh, uh, Joe Dante, this is his little bit more family friendly, uh, comedic follow-up to the franchise. Uh, it is a really fun movie. I, I really enjoy it. Um, it's one that for me was kind of making the rounds on HBO, um, when I was a kid. So it's one that popped up quite a bit. Uh, so I saw it probably way too many times as a kid, um, but, you know, the, you, you got to love just how goofy they got with it. Like, you know, Key and, Pe Key and Peele did a whole sketch just about how weird that writer's room must have been, uh, you know, where it's basically just just throw any idea against the wall and it's probably going to stick so in terms of the types of gremlins. So you get, you know, the, the lady gremlin, the lightning gremlin, the vegetable gremlin, the spider gremlin. Uh, they really just kind of went bonkers. And, uh, you know, I think it gave uh, Rick Baker a chance to do a lot of really fun stuff and uh you know all the 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 old familiar characters are there uh, you got zach galligan you got phoebe cates uh of course the great dick miller um is is in there um i also really love uh john glover uh as clamp kind of the <laughs> if <laughs> if if trump wasn't an utter piece of crap like if it was someone who managed to be likable, but was still just like an over the top real estate guy, that would be clamp. Um, you know, it's just it, it, everything about this movie is fun. And I just think that's a, a good way to kick this off. And, you know, I think, uh, anything we can do to, to have a little bit of fun right now is, is a good way to go. That's a fun one. That's a fun one because when you think of gremlins, gremlins itself is a lot of fun, but gremlins to the new batch, just, cranked everything up to 11 and i feel like joe dante thought that he had nothing to lose literally by doing that movie and just let everything go bonkers in the best possible way so i feel like the joy of gremlins just gets amplified so much in that movie and rick baker and his entire special effects team like they i know heather has has uh dove into this in uh like monster squad uh her book and in her interviews with with that team they were allowed so much time to work on those special effects and the Mogwais and the gremlins. And I feel like it's so rare that they were given that much creative freedom for a sequel that really went so far away from the original, but, but, you know, still is so lovable too. So I, I love that pick that I think that's, that's a really good one. And I think a lot of people still have yet to discover how, how much fun that movie is too. Oh, yeah. I my face lit up with excitement when I heard you say Gremlins to the new batch. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> the first time my face lit up, it was when you said that your picks were going to have the number two in them. And it just made me think of like the 90s, like too fast, too like furious, whatever. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, for what it's worth, all but one of these movies will be from the 90s. Ah, okay. Okay. Oh, I thought you were going to say Fast and Furious franchise, but that works too. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, let's not ask for too much, too much goodness. <laughs> we'll explode. No, but I... Don't I, get greedy. I know, don't get greedy. But I, I don't know if this is blasphemous to say, but I think the new batch is my favorite sequel. 
I think because like of any just, movie ever. I think so. Yeah, Whoa. because it's just so much nostalgia <laughs> behind it. I understand that, but it's so fun. And how can you not enjoy a gremlin? There is, I'm pretty sure it's from the new batch, but um, there's a gif that I see on Twitter all the time um, where they're like in the movie theater. There's a bunch of them like in the movie theater and they're like talking and like throwing popcorn and stuff around. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I think that's about? the first one. Uh, that scene oh, with okay. the... Oh, okay. So, but what part two does have is uh, the the kind of total breaking of the fourth wall and the gremlins actually like destroy the film while the movie is going and they have to get told off by the Hulk to get the projector going again. (laughs) I mean, come on, that's bizarre in the best (laughs) way. I love it. I listen, I'm sorry. I feel like I made you all gasp. (laughs) No, in a totally good way. No, I just, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I know. I, I understand that little me. Little Tamika uh, was speaking a lot (laughs) just then, but it's true. I even, I even had a moment where I was afraid of gremlins Mm. and I thought that they were going to get me and then I would somehow become one. Uh, So the new bash made me less afraid of them actually. So that might have to do, I don't know. Forced you to face your fears. (laughs) Did. It go. did. It made me a better person. <laughs> Gremlins I'm too. I, it makes you a better person. I, I'm, <laughs> yes, glad I could give, uh, I'm glad I could give Tamika this welcome back present of, yes. uh, of Gremlins too. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thank all you. downhill from here. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see about that because, Derek, it's, uh, it's on to you now. What's your theme and what's your first movie? Okay. So my theme is – has three different names uh choose whichever one you prefer uh so my theme is feels like fall slash fall fling slash oktoberfest because all of my (laughs) movies for this theme is that gonna fit on the poster (laughs) it will we'll make it fit we'll use a certain (laughs) font size that'll fit (laughs) it's worth it i feel like not I want to go with all three, like AKA, like I love movies that have alternate titles. And then you realize that it it was released in different regions under different titles. So I want to do that with this curated marathon. In Germany, it would be like Oktoberfest, but like here it's it's fall fling. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm picking a weird one. And uh, yeah, I like it because (laughs) all of my movies kind of have a fall autumnal feel to them they feel like october maybe they feel like halloween but at the end of the day they feel like a movie that makes you feel like fall so whether it's the leaves or the apple cider or the halloween decorations it it just brings that fall feeling to you so and since we're in october i figured this was fitting and should make some sense. So with that in mind, my first movie, which may come as no surprise to longstanding listeners is going to be Hocus Pocus, Disney's Hocus Pocus, <laughs> because I never I heard of it. Feel, really? <laughs> and that's why we need to start it off with Hocus Pocus. I feel like nothing really screams fall more than Halloween and Salem. And I just love really everything about this movie. I've seen this movie probably more, more times than many movies I've seen just because ABC family, which is now free form has played it on constant rotation for about 25 years. And I don't think they've played anything else other than pretty little liars um, on that network in that time, <laughs> which, you know, it's great. It's great. I, I'm not complaining, <laughs> but, but I feel like uh, I, I just love this movie. I, it spends so much time with the trick or treating. It spends so much time building that small New England town atmosphere. And even the parents get dressed up and go to a big costume party. I, like, you know, watching Max go through the cemetery and watching them trick or treat and then the whole showdown in at the Sanderson sisters' home. I feel like everything about this movie just brings that ominous feel. So even though this movie was 
originally released, I believe in July theatrically, uh, I feel like this movie is the definition of, of like a fall family friendly horror movie. So that is why it's starting it off. So, cause I don't want to start too scary either. So Derek, if you remember back to our, um, pick between two movies episode, uh, you'll know I've had a little bit of a journey with, with Hocus Pocus. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't too into it as a kid. Um, but it's one that my wife kind of dragged me kicking and screaming to as an adult. Um, and I'll say probably even the first couple times I saw it, uh, it was, uh, not a taste I had acquired. Um, but over the years it has become one that like, I don't know if it's like some weird form of like Stockholm syndrome where it's just like, I keep having to watch this movie. So like, I've just made myself like it. Um, I, I don't think it's anything like that. I, I just think I've really kind of turned a corner on just how charming this movie is like it's it's so much fun and if nothing else like Bette Midler uh Kathy Nugini and Sarah Jessica Parker like what can you say about them like they're just so much fun to watch um and and you're right it's just it's one of those movies that like it's just a, a great way to make you get into the spirit of both fall and Halloween. Um, so it is one that, uh, like we, we broke Scott's heart during that either or episode. Cause I took this one overnight <laughs> of the creeps. I know. <laughs> so good. I think we that all was a did, tough didn't call we? though. I, I think yeah, he was like all by himself. I think it was island. unanimous. Yeah. As soon as Scott. Yeah. As soon as Derek said, hocus pocus, that's what I went to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poor Scott. But yes, um, great pick, Derek. I absolutely love this movie. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel like there's a lot of people that, as popular as it is, I feel like there's a lot of people that still need to discover the magic of this movie, whether you just didn't catch it or you don't watch cable TV or whatever it is. I feel like there's a lot of people that still need to find out how cool this movie is. And I feel like it may be overhyped now because it's been on for so long and people just talk about it endlessly, but you never know. Maybe it'll turn some heads. You know, it's kind of Halloween's a Christmas story. This is true. Yes. Oh my gosh. You're right. (laughs) Whoa. Mind blown. But yeah, this is a, you know, a movie. I mean, and I always say on, on the podcast is that we assume that, you know, I, well, I, I shouldn't say we because I don't assume, but I think the, I, when I see on, on Twitter that, you know, everybody kind of assumes that everybody has seen a lot of those, you know, milestone movies. But but the truth is that there are so many movies and it's like, you know, I mean, I remember for, you know, when, when I was growing up, it was like movie. I was still watching movies from the like 60s and 50s like they were current. And, you know, people who are, um, you know, in their teens today are watching movies from like the 90s and early 2000s. But I mean, you look back further, it's like, you know, I mean, Universal Monsters in some ways is ancient to them. It doesn't mean that, you know, teens aren't watching those. And if you are great, you know, because there's all these old horror movies to watch. Um, but we have to remember that there are a lot of people because there are so many horror movies these days that are coming out and that, you know, uh, year after year after year, that people are having some, some major gaps. So, um, I can, uh, imagine for sure that some people listening right now have not seen Hocus Pocus or some of the other movies that we're going to name. So even if some people have, um, I, I do notice that, you know, from these lists, we end up turning on quite a few people to, uh, some movies either that have been on their list for a while or that they uh, maybe haven't considered. I don't know if you guys know this, but, or maybe it's just a Maryland thing, but I've noticed that Hocus Pocus is playing in theaters. Now, I am also not encouraging anyone to go to theaters, but I I noticed that it is playing and that it is doing somewhat well. Um, So there is also that. Yeah, I didn't know but that, really? but I do know that some, I mean, they are releasing some classics back to theaters. I mean, and, and even, you know, thankfully, most of these are on, in drive-ins as well. So, like, you can see Halloween and um, and some of the sequels are, are playing um, in drive-ins as well. Yeah, for sure. But, like, yeah, I, I would check it on out on, like, Freeform, because I'm telling you, that is playing probably every night uh, in <laughs> October. <laughs> it is. <laughs> It's the go-to. No. 
Yeah. Odds are if you like if you turn on Freeform right now, no matter when you're listening to this, there's like a 75% chance Hocus Pocus will be on right now. <laughs> that sounds about <laughs> right. Doesn't matter if it's March, May, or October. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's Tamika, the beauty of it. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Tamika, why don't you tell us about your theme and your first movie? Okay. So my theme, I want to apologize because the last time I uh, participated in the drive-in marathon, I realized that I picked a lot of Debbie Downers. Uh, It's a lot of shark (laughs) movies, a lot of death. It was vacation all I ever wanted, right? That was your, that was your theme. Yeah. Yes. uh, for last year's uh, and death is okay this is a horror movie podcast so that's true that comes with the territory that is a good point but i felt bad because all four of them were like that so i thought i would look out for the listeners and i would pick horror musicals so that's my theme and i thought that it would be a good idea to stay in the vein of um Hocus Pocus and maybe pick like the second. Wh- wait, what did Brian say? Hocus Pocus is the Christmas story for Halloween. Well, this would be the second movie for it, like in, in, like in, uh, that would be, it would, this would be the second movie. And so my first pick, we're going to start off light The Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> nice. I, I understand. Classic. I understand. You know, listen, I, it's been hyped to death. It also is probably playing every day on Freeform this month. But it's a really wonderful movie. And it's got great songs. You could sing along in your car, you know. Maybe you could, like, join the people in the car next to you and singing. Um Almost every song is really good, honestly. Even like the Oogie Boogie song. (laughs) (laughs) It's catchy. Now I'm just just picturing like sidling up to somebody at a red light, putting my window down, getting them to roll it down and just going, what's this? What's this? There's magic in the air and seeing how quickly until they drive away and or call the police. (laughs) You know you're in good company though if they can complete it. (laughs) Yes. That is true. <laughs> Secret handshake. Yes. yes. It's how you make friends. You can make friends also at the drive in, but stay distanced for right now. <laughs> I, I feel like I was selling that, but I don't have to sell that. I don't have to sell the nightmare before Christmas. It's no. a classic. No, you're you're preaching to the choir here. Yeah. It's gotta be one of the most recognizable animated movies ever made. I think even now when we've seen technology advance in so many animated movies in recent years. I feel like this movie is still the standard and that everyone recognizes it, even if they haven't seen it. And the songs are so catchy. And the great thing about it is it's all, it's a Halloween movie and a Christmas movie. So you can really watch it like three months out of the year and not feel any weird about it. I mean, it, it just makes sense. It's also interesting because it's like seen as kind of quintessentially the quintessential Tim Burton movie, even though technically it's not a Tim Burton movie. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Henry Selleck movie. (laughs) Obviously he was, you know, heavily involved. Um, But, uh, you know, I I think a lot of people, you know, operate under the mistaken assumption that he directed it too. Well, when you call it Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, (laughs) you're like, wait a minute. (laughs) Henry Selleck's The Nightmare Before Christmas. But as long as the joy is still there, I suppose. (laughs) (laughs) But you're right, though. I didn't even realize that until years later that Tim Burton didn't actually direct it because it feels like so Tim Burton-y. You know, it it feels like something that came out of the Beetlejuice universe. Yeah, if you got people, I I mean, you'd get half the crowd for trivia on that with the wrong answer. (laughs) But as long, I guess if it if it helped to get to a wider distribution, then I suppose. I mean, that Disney was, was releasing thing. it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no. I'm, yeah, you're. That's a good point. I'm not going to die on this hill, but you know, it is what it is. 
<laughs> you were about to. I sensed it. <laughs> I was ready, and I, I stepped back. I'm like, uh, I'll, I'll save my fight for another battle. There's other <laughs> fights to fight. <laughs> it's like if you called 2018's Halloween like John Carpenter's Halloween. <sighs> I don't know about mm. that either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We're about to have a whole other conversation. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll sidebar that. that. I'll text you. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But um okay. Well, um so yes, yeah, so that started musicals and um we'll we'll move on to my my pick, which is um my theme first is going to be invasion. Um that's my my pick or my theme and um you know, I wanted to do something a little different because, you know, you'd expect me to go vampires, which I did last year, or zombies, which I didn't do this year. Um, and, you know, I've been watching, I've noticed, and we've talked about this on our quarantine catch-up episodes, that I've been watching less heavy um, horror movies, or at least n- new heavy horror movies, because some of these you may consider heavy, but... Um, I've definitely been watching more of the classics. I've definitely been, you know, watching, you know, whether it's comedies or, um, you know, cartoons. So I've, I've been kind of hopping all over the place. I haven't stuck just with horror. And so, yeah, so I want to do a little more sci-fi in some case. You may say it's sci-fi horror. Um, but yeah, so that's what, what my theme was. And I followed a certain path to, I guess, what everybody else has done here, which is, you know, we're having the drive-in you know, the sun just started to set and, you know, you're, you're strapping in, you're going to be in, you know, until four in the morning, um, watching movies. We're not going to get everybody for, for all four movies. Cause you know, usually if you go to a drive-in, you got, you know, commercials and breaks and, you know, I'd say you lose at least 50 or 80% of the people by the last movie, they're either sleeping or they left. So I want to get a movie in that I thought would be good for kids and adults. And so um, for this invasion theme, our alien invasion, um, I'm going to start with Critters. I think Critters is a is a fun movie that I don't think enough people have seen it. You know, again, we talk about, you know, those movies are like, well, of course people have seen Critters. Well, yeah, a lot of people have. But, you know, I think, um, you know, people may have uh, gaps where they haven't checked it out. Maybe you love Gremlins. You haven't seen Critters. Maybe you, um, you know, are... are just starting to get into horror movies and sci-fi and you haven't, uh, you know, made it back to Critters. But I think Critters is actually, I mean, it's, it's more of a, a cult film. Um, and um, certainly I would say, which is, maybe it's weird. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there are other people out there that they do the same thing. I watch Critters more than I watch Gremlins. People would be like, blasphemy. But I don't know, for some reason. Um, I, I know I've, I've seen the Critters movies more often than I've seen, you know, the first two Gremlins. I haven't seen the Gremlins two in ages, but, um, there's something about those, those little crites, um, <laughs> that, uh, I have a lot of fun with. And, um, you know, I think it's that, you know I mean? The Gremlins are kind of that way too, but it's just, uh, those crites are, are relentless and, you know, they're attacking this, um, you know, they're attacking this you know, family in the first one where they're kind of in this, you know, remote house and, um, you know, it starts out with, you know, them, them running around a little bit and then they, they roll and, you know, they got those spines they can shoot you with. You get bigger gremlins or, or excuse me, I see there, I said gremlins, you get bigger critters, you get the, um, you know, that massive, um, you know, what do you call it? Like bowling ball or boulder, (laughs) um, crite. And so I think this one's a lot of fun and I love that this goes like they kind of go for it. Whereas like gremlins, you know, is mainly focused on the creatures that are attacking themselves. And of course, you know, our, our protagonists, but in this case, it's kind of split between the humans on, you know, the, the humans kind of trying to defend themselves against these crites and then the alien bounty hunters who are there to stop them. And I think that in most movies, they probably have been like, well, you can just do enough with the critters, so let's scrap the bounty hunter piece, but they put it in and they left it. It not only adds some um, comedy, but it adds weirdness to the series, which, you know, again, it didn't necessarily need to have, but I think it's uh, it's pretty cool here. So, yeah, this is a weird sci-fi movie, um, and uh, I think for kids as well, especially now, I mean, it's it's I believe it's R-rated. I'm pretty positive it's R, it was R-rated when it came out. It's 
I, I think almost everybody could watch. I don't even, I think there's nudity in the second one, but not this. So it's a family friendly movie movie. And, um, you know, young kids can kind of get away with watching an R rated film at the drive-in. So anyway, long story short, Critters is my first pick. So I, I have seen Critters and Critters too, but I'll be honest. I think I was, I haven't seen it since I was maybe 10 or younger. So I only have kind of like flashes of memories about it. So first I just want to make sure I'm remembering like this movie correctly. Was there a scene in one of the first two where like the bounty hunters go to a bowling alley and like shoot one of the lanes with a bazooka or something like that? Or am I just completely making that up? No, that is correct. Okay, so I'm I'm remembering the right movies, and I think the thing I remember the most uh, from the the brief flashes of of memory I have is this is a bit of a meaner franchise than Gremlins, correct? Like they, like I think you were saying, like they kind of go for it more than than Gremlins um, and and Gremlins too, um, and I think this gets a little bit more into like people die in these movies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they they, they definitely earn their R rating, or at least they did at the time. Um, and of course you can't be, and I think this might, you know, and again, this is a little fuzzy for me, so this might be the second one, but, uh, the, uh, the, the guy in the Easter bunny suit is kind of the, the classic one that people think of. That's um, the second one. That's the second one. All right. Um, I think this is one I need to, uh, to revisit cause it's been a very long time. So I, I need to refresh my memory from kind of just these little bits and pieces that, uh, that are kind of in the cobwebs of my mind right now. Yeah, and it's got D. Wallace. So Well, there's yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Can't go wrong with D. Wallace. And Scott Grimes. I don't know if anybody sees it, watches the Orville, but he's the um does any do any of you? But uh, I don't know. Well um, I, I listen to American Dad, so uh I I know he plays a character on there. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but yeah, he's like in the he's McFarlane like universe. Yeah, he's like the pilot in the Orville. And I was like, Oh, that guy oh, looks nice. familiar and I'm like Oh, it's, it's Scott Grimes, who's the, you know, the only thing I, I knew him from was the, the kid in, uh, in Critters, but it's all grown up now. Wow. He is still very much a ginger. I just looked him up. Yeah. <laughs> and it is PG-13. Interesting. You know, I, and I, and I, oh, to wow, me, it's. that time too. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely one that pushes it then. Cause, uh, yeah, I thought oh, it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, go I'll ahead. So, yeah, good. so I think this is one where, uh, yeah, you can kind of get away with a little more R-rated content in a, in a uh, what do you call it, PG-13 movie. That second one can't be, though. There's nudity, unless it's one of those where they're like, it doesn't matter if there's nudity and death. We'll still give it a PG-13. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 80s, and I feel like there was a lot of what we would consider boundary pushing now, but back then they wouldn't have even batted an eye at that, you know? It's Plus, I think they were still scary. kind of, they were still kind of figuring out that PG thirteen lane. Like, what, what constitutes PG thirteen? Like, I think they've got it pretty well set now. But I think you kind of probably had a little bit more leeway back then. Yeah, they. I'm looking at it right now. Even, even, uh, even the second one apparently was PG thirteen. So yeah, this is. We'll we'll advertise it as PG thirteen. Kids will be like, oh my god. <laughs> Parents will be like, oh my god. But yeah. <laughs> Fun for the whole family. <laughs> yeah, and what a great, what a great, uh, I and mean, we already have a Gremlins movie and a Critters movie. If we just got a Ghoulies movie, we'd we'd complete the trifecta. But what a great time for like little monster movies in the 80s where it just was this little wave of, and then of course we had Hobgoblins and things like that. So very much uh, tapping into that 80s uh, micro creature features. I, when I was a kid, I got so confused by a lot of these tiny monster movies because for a long time <laughs> I confused uh, critters with ghoulies mm. and I absolutely refused to watch any of the critters movies because I thought they were ghoulies that, yeah yeah and I didn't figure that out like I didn't figure out that I had mixed up the two franchises until I was older <laughs> it's a lot to keep track of though i mean there's especially as a kid you're like wait which one is this like they're all little monsters they're all trying to they're all like kind of fun but they're also killing people so you're like confused by that too (laughs) it was a great time to be alive it really was (laughs) (laughs) they're all like slimy and green and uh, yeah i was just not 
I was not into it. The, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, I kind of, I wanted to pick Ghoulies, but I, I didn't. But I, the coming out of the toilet, there was always that too. They were always coming out of like a sink or the shower or the toilet or and something. The thing was, think, that scene is so short. And they, but that was what they put on the poster. I mean, it was, it was a great, and the VHS cover, it's a great cover, but like that little ghoulie comes out of the toilet for like five seconds. It's not a very long scene at all, but that's what they ended up. I mean, it doesn't even do anything. It just, it's just part of a montage. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, it's bizarre, but fun. Like it's bizarre fun. Yeah. I mean, it's great marketing. It's like, you know, people really gravitated towards it. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the I'm going to say monsters. bizarre a lot, but I promise I don't mean it in a bad way. I really like bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, that will end our first round of movies and we'll circle back in a minute, but you know, kind of like we do at the drive-in, we'll do a quick intermission and uh, we're not going away, but we are going to be talking about something else. And that is candy because you can't have a drive-in without offering some kind of treat or candy or snack. So um, I'll, I'll throw it around the room very quickly. Um, does anyone here have any new snack revelations, any go-to snacks when you're watching movies? Um, I'll kick us off quickly because um, I know I just threw the question out there randomly while you think about it for a minute. I just found out, and a lot of people know that I do love, I'm obsessed with sour candies, I love sour candies, and I've had, I know at some point I've had sour Mike and Ikes, and they were not as good as they are right now, but um, somebody had brought me sour Mike and Ikes, I'm like, oh, and I tried them, and they're like one of my new favorite sour candies, like they're really good, like if you eat the whole box, it will burn your mouth out. (laughs) And They they improved the formula. (laughs) Oh, they improved the formula. I think before it was like tangy. But now, like, it's a good sour. It's, it's towards the top of my list. My favorite, as listeners should know at this point, <laughs> is I love Sour Punch straws. But not the, not, the, um, not the long straws. I like the little bites. They put them in, they put them in these, um, what do you call it? These, like, metallic sealed, like, almost like vacuum sealed bags. And it keeps them moist. And, it ke- and they're... And they're what do you call it? And they're like in smaller bites and they're different colors, different flavors. And those are my favorite hands down. It's like the right consistency of chewy and sweet and sour. If you give me a bag, I will eat it in, in one sitting. But that being said, the Sour Mike and Ike's are a close second now. I really do like them. So, mm. um, yeah. Nice. I did, maybe you didn't need to know that. I promise you that Mike and Ike didn't pay me to say that. Mike or Ike, they, neither one of them paid me. And um, <laughs> But uh, I just felt like I was compelled to share that with both our listeners and, and my co-hosts. So, um, so anyway, so that's going to be one of my go-to candies this weekend. I'm going to watch some movies, and uh, I will be eating my Mike and Ikes. Um, so let's see. Derek, what do you got for us? Hmm. Well, I think I grossed everyone out the last driving episode by talking about my love of raisin nets. Uh. And I still love raisin nets. I love dark chocolate raisin nets. I love the taste of them. Uh, but I will and I, I, I should try out the sour Mike and Ike's because I love to just fry my taste buds with like really hot foods and sour foods. So that would be uh, fun, I think, to try that out because I haven't had that in probably over 10 years. Uh, but I would say probably my, I mean, my go-to like throughout quarantine was pretty much the tried and true popcorn. We have like an old Mr. Popper two from the eighties that will just like pop the popcorn kernels and just throw a little salt and butter on there and, and eat that up. So that's always been good. And, uh, but my other candy other than Raisinets that I've always loved is Junior Mints because it feels to me like you're also taking care of your teeth while you're eating candy. <laughs> because but it tastes are like you? <laughs> <laughs> and I love like, Junior Mints. You don't have Mints. to brush your teeth. <laughs> but I don't think you don't that have that's to brush your teeth after having Junior Mints. <laughs> <laughs> it's dentist what approved. What are you? <laughs> um, do you like, like I the feel Junior like Mints? My- 
My oh. breath is minty fresh. I'm also enjoying <laughs> this taste. Like this is a win-win for my teeth and for my taste buds. Actually sounds like I'm surprised no one has come up with a junior mint flavored toothpaste. Well, now we'll have to either look into that or make it. But mm-hmm. you know what? When you said junior mint, I first went to peppermint patty. Which do you prefer? Uh, it sounds yes. like junior mints. Uh, I love. I really like peppermint patty, but for whatever reason, I'm just around junior mints a lot more. Like it's available. Like I've never like like when theaters were open, it it was always available. And I just don't see peppermint patties being sold as much in Minnesota, whether it's like in the checkout lane or at a movie theater for whatever reason, junior mints are just more readily available. So I guess I would just say junior mints for that reason. Have you had peppermint patty bites? They're almost like junior mints. They're like the same size. Don't think I've, no, I've, the only time I've had peppermint patties is when it's that like full patty where you unwrap the tin foil. Yeah. yeah. And you, yeah. So that's the only version I've had. But it's I, the bites sound really good. I'm pretty sure they're, also, they're bites. I might be making this up, but I'm like 90%. I wouldn't bet my gotta life be careful. on it. <laughs> got to be careful of the junior mints, though, because I have in a friend's car, um, like, accidentally sat on one, and then it just left a horrible stain on the car seat. So it's just not good. Just... Just so make sure you, you might not want to take it to the drive-in. <laughs> yeah, that is. I didn't think about that, but like, candy, it's really candy bad. accidents is a, it's, it's real. It is real and it is not fun. I don't. I don't but know other than I, that, good experience. Yeah, I'm sure I have a good story of messing something up in the drive-in, but not. I can't think of anything. I had. Um, my mom's my mom gonna kill me. She well, why do you share this? Why do you share the story? But we were in the theater. I think it was her that like almost like that tipped a drink on me as she was walking past me. So like I remember that. And I think somebody dropped a bucket of popcorn on me while they were walking past me as well. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever <laughs> I don't think I've ever messed up either somebody or their car. I can't think of it. Okay then. Um, while I, while I think about it, if I, if I have a good story, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, Tamika, I'm going to m- move on to you. Do you have a, you have a go-to candy or snack? I, well, I have so many. It's hard to pick children. <laughs> it's hard to pick my children. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I've been on the kettle corn train lately. Um, it's weird. That's a hell of a train. Through think it is i you know sweet and salty train uh, <laughs> uh oh yeah i it's it's like totally it's super weird i normally would always uh go chocolate kit kats or like m&ms something like you know easy kind of not too messy but i mean it's chocolate so you can't get around that but lately i've been really into kettle corn so that would be my go to it's like, I think I like it for the same reason that Jonathan and Derek like sour things. It's just kind of like this, I don't know, it's this like overwhelming taste <laughs> on your taste buds. Like, well, okay, we got a lot going on here. <laughs> you know, it's not just like salty, buttery popcorn, which I'm not really a fan of. So I think I've committed two blasphemies <laughs> that don't like uh, butter popcorn. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, that the, the new batch is my favorite sequel. No, I mean, not liking uh, buttery popcorn, especially depending <laughs> on where you go. Like, I'm, I'm not I'm going to get off my soapbox here in a minute. Um, the theater experience, <laughs> you know, in a lot of theaters, not every theater, right? Local theaters, um, you know, uh, draft house, you know, there's, there's some people that, that they, they have quality food, right? But if you go to a lot of other theaters, you know, I'm just going to call them out. If you go to Regal, cause I have Regal, Regals around me. I mean, the popcorn stale, the butter is no good and they're charging, you know, mm. six or $10 for a bucket and it's terrible. Mm. And if you, you know, make it in your, if you make popcorn, it's much cheaper to, you know, if you make it at home and air pop it, it tastes delicious. You can put as much, you know, real butter as you want, or you can do, um, you know, there's a, like, I think like, uh, what is it? I think it's like coconut, um, I think it's like coconut oil, butter, mm-hmm. something like that. So if you want a more healthy Ooh. choice, you can do that. And, um, 
And yeah, so I mean, uh, you, you probably have just had a lot of terrible popcorn and terrible butter. So I don't, I don't blame you because, um, yeah, it's kind of nasty. Okay. Fair. That is very true. And then I started again, don't do this listeners, but (laughs) I, in my day, uh, have smuggled in many a snack (laughs) from the outside and whole meals. I've also done that. I think because I really didn't like the taste of the movie theaters popcorn. So that's true. Yeah. And I'll Mm. say, no, go ahead and do that. Listeners. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. They overcharge for all of that stuff. So yeah, if you can, if you can get stuff in, I say do it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, to me, it just depends on the place. I mean, you want to, I mean, you know, it's, uh, for like, again, for like mom pop theaters, like drive-in theaters, like they rely on that. Um, even for ones like when I went to the drive-in, when they allowed, um, just recently, uh, in Chicago, when they allowed me to like, they allow you to bring your own food. I still bought stuff to support them. And I think that kind of stuff's important. But in other cases, like when you go and, and you know, they're serving you like the cheapest possible food at the highest possible prices when they don't have healthy options, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? And then, you know, um, if you have dietary restrictions, um, you know, which, um, you know, my, my mom, my, my wife, they, they frequently do. So they'll want to bring in snacks so they can have it. So they can continue to have, you know, healthy snack um, when they're supposed to. And, um, you know, they, they can't purchase anything at the theater. They literally don't have an option. So it's like we want to give you more of our money when you don't have things that we're able to uh, to consume. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. that, all, that all makes sense. Um, but let me uh, let me move it on to Brian. And Brian, why don't you, uh, you, you what do you got? What's your snack? What's your go to? So, so snacks and candy at a movie are it's a precarious preposition for me because usually I will have hoovered it by the time the, the trailers are done. Um, so I need to try and find something <laughs> that I can like that there's a lot of little pieces too. So like my go-tos, if I'm uh, buying something from the theater is going to be like, if I want something fruity, I'll usually go Skittles. If I want something a little bit more like savory sweet, I'll go like Reese's pieces. Um, in terms of something that I found recently, that's like a really good munchable snack. If we're talking, especially if we're talking about something you bring in, um, so I don't know how many people are familiar with the different trail mixes that uh, Target makes, like their store brand, Archer Farms. Uh, so they make stuff oh, yeah. like Monster. It's so good. It's so bad for you. Like it's candy. It's just candy. <laughs> it's not trail mix. But, um, this year I found a version. It's like a like a coffee espresso mix that has like uh, chocolate covered espresso beans and like these oh. little toffee crunches and pecans and stuff. It's so good. And as someone who loves the regular monster, I actually like this even more. Um, so like if you're doing, you know, if you're doing something where you're trying to find something that you want to bring in with you um, and, uh, you know, this is going to be kind of a um, – a focused group of people because you need to kind of like coffee in your candy. Um, this is definitely a way to go. I would definitely recommend it. See, I like coffee in anything, so I, I will definitely try that out because anything that will help keep me awake is is a good thing. So definitely caffeine will generally do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you did mention, Brian, about how you'll finish your snacks before, like during the trailers. Mm-hmm. And I am notorious at that. <laughs> like it's, and I'm going to take us on, I'm going to take us on a, a journey <laughs> before Ooh, we, have a we get back. So I don't know if, if any, well, I don't know how often you go with your family or you did when you went to the movies, but like when I was younger, I had small hands because I was a child. So of course I had small hands and my dad is over six feet tall. So when we're sharing a popcorn bucket, the amount of popcorn he can grab in like one handful is significantly more than I can grab with my tiny child hands at the time. So like I, like I would have to like try to grab as many pieces of popcorn as quickly as possible and shovel it into my mouth before my dad finished the popcorn (laughs) on me. And I didn't realize that this was a thing. So when I ever, I ate popcorn growing up, I ate it like I hadn't eaten for years. And um, I only noticed this when I started, you know, dating Christy 15 years ago or or so. And we'd go to the movies. And 
we'd get the popcorn and she'd go in to get her popcorn. I'd just be shoveling into my mouth and I'd finish it before the trailers. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm a monster. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is now, like some kind of like evolutionary trait where like your body is just like, if I don't eat the popcorn now, I'll never get the popcorn. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. And so I've now had to, now I realize that I'm, I realize I have a problem. I'm taking <laughs> steps 15 years later I'm still working on it, but I try to eat popcorn slower, not take as much popcorn. <laughs> One easy solve is that we just have separate buckets. But long story short is that, yes, I, I finish or I used to finish most of the popcorn before the trailers. And what's the point? Like, it's supposed to last for a lot of the movie, but it's still it's it's a it's a regular struggle for me. <laughs> See, I, I wish I had that kind of story to explain why I'm that way. I'm just an a-hole. Like I just like will plow through and then I'm then the guy that you need to watch out for because I'm going to start eyeing down like your stuff if you haven't eaten it already. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm a snacker. I can't I can't help myself. Yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, I um like I said, something I learned about myself and I'm like, oh my God, I'm a monster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's move it back to our original topic. Um, we, we like two hour episodes, but, um, <laughs> but we want to at least cap it at two hours. So Brian, uh, why don't you take us back? Take us back to your drive-in. The intermission is over. What are we watching for our second movie? All right. So we're on to our next number two. Um, so our, our number, our second number two or number two, number two. Um, so at this point, like we're pretty well into the evening. The sun's probably fully gone down. Kids are probably either asleep, the ones that aren't having it anymore. I'm sure the, the, the parents have taken them home or it's just the adults or the kids who are ready for kind of the more hardcore stuff. So we're going to lean a little bit more into a nice solid R rating and we're going to go with Predator Part 2. Uh, from Stephen Hopkins, who um, ha you might know from another kind of maligned sequel to a franchise. He is responsible for Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. And I am guessing I'm going to be in the minority here, but I believe that Predator 2 is a more enjoyable movie than the original Predator. And... I am a big fan of the original Predator, um, but I think what I enjoy about the second one is actually something I, that kind of threw me off when I was a kid because, A, it's a different setting. I like that they brought it to the city. Uh, when I was a little kid, I, I didn't – I don't think I quite jived with that originally because I was like – wait, that's, this takes place in the jungle. Why are we in LA? Um, and the other thing that I didn't know was coming, uh, is that, uh, instead of Arnold Schwarzenegger, we have Danny Glover and I really love the dynamic of Danny Glover against a predator, you know, as opposed to like the absolute kind of, you know, alpha male, just a big group of guys like, you know, like, uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jesse Ventura, things like that. We have like poor Danny Glover and Ruben blades and, you know, Bill Paxton, uh, just a bunch of people who are like really not equipped to deal with this thing. And, I just think that makes it a lot more fun to watch. And I, I kind of love that. It's basically, you know, Danny Glover is doing, if you put Roger Murtaugh from, uh, lethal weapon into a sci-fi horror hybrid. Cause he's throwing off those one liners. Uh, he's just got a kind of this exasperated attitude, the entire movie. Um, and it's just a lot of fun to watch. Um, now one big caveat I do need to put out there. Uh, and, and this is something that I probably didn't recognize consciously until, um, uh, if anybody listens to really melanated with, uh, Ashley Blackwell and Carolyn Morissette, um, Carolyn Carol Morris had brought up this movie as an example of uh, a really, really racist movie. When you think about the uh, the beginning of the movie, Danny Glover is kind of investigating this drug war, and it's between the uh, Jamaicans and the Colombians, and the absolute over the top stereotyping that they do with these two groups of people is actually really cringe inducing. So, um, you know that that kind of 
caveat aside, um, this movie is a lot of fun. Plus, I forgot to mention Gary Busey's in this movie. And whenever you have a, you know, if you have a movie where you can pick Gary Busey versus The Predator, it's going to be fun. So I really enjoy this movie. It's big, it's dopey, and it's uh, uh, it's also got that uh, Easter egg at the end uh, where you get to see that first hint at a uh, an expanded universe where you see the Xenomorph skull um, that would finally come to fruition, I guess, what, about 10 years later when Alien vs. <laughs> Predator finally hit the screen. Just like Freddy vs. <laughs> Jason. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just takes about a decade. <laughs> Yeah, for I, you know, I love for me, pick. I was gonna say, yeah, this is this is a good one. Um, I don't think this is a better movie than Predator, but I do think this one's probably more rewatchable. So I kind of, so I, I definitely get where you're coming from. I mean, I think and I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, because I mean, th- there's only. I think the really great thing about Predator, especially if you don't know what you're getting into, is kind of that switch up where then we realize, you know, how much of a a sci-fi movie this is, this actually is. Um, after you have that kind of like straightforward, like action packed intro, and then you go into the like, you know, man versus predator, um, at the end. So, but I mean, I, I don't, I, as, and I love the movie, but you know, for me, it's not necessarily something I would run over and over again. Um, but there's a lot going on in, in Predator too, and I think it expands the world in really exciting ways. Um, you know, the like I said, I mean, totally the end as well, but also, you know, um, in terms of you know the, the Predator's weapons, um, I think they do some fun things with being able to give you know give the the Predator some new tricks, and um, and. Uh, Bill Paxton's in that one too. So I forgot about that for a minute. And Bill Paxton, I believe the only person who has played characters to be killed by a predator, a terminator and a xenomorph. Yeah. I, 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 well, yeah. Well, I'm thinking, um, I believe Lance Henriksen has that too though doesn't he got a terminator is he in one of the predators he's an alien versus predator he is an alien versus predator and 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 i guess i guess bishop (laughs) does eventually get turned off in three so yeah i think that fits yeah okay we'll allow it (laughs) (laughs) it's a stretch it's a it's a it's a small group still yeah, it's, it's a group of two, worst case. <laughs> I'll leave now. <laughs> I love that pick, though, because I feel like Predator, I, I love the first Predator is one of my favorite horror movies, horror sci-fi movies, whatever you want to call it, just because it was on so much growing up that I saw it so many times. And Predator 2 was on probably just a fraction of the time that the original Predator was on TV. So I feel like it's one that gets forgotten a, a little bit and kind of like Gremlins to the new batch where there's a lot to enjoy, but it's not really thought of as much when you think of that franchise. Uh, so I, I like that a lot. I think it sheds light on kind of the forgotten one of the forgotten sequels, because, of course, Aliens, everyone kind of regards that as like the alien movie now. But Predator 2 doesn't have that same like prestige as aliens. So I feel like this kind of uh, spotlights it a little bit more, which is, is much needed. But no, Brian, I, I agree with you. It's, it feels weird to like a movie like predators because of its issues, you know, and there are so many of them. Uh, It's, it's really cringy. And what I was going to say earlier was that it's, it's so, difficult sometimes because or a lot of times maybe you know depending on what you like because you have to figure out you have to navigate that you know like uh, this movie is really cringy but it's good and it doesn't mean that you like the cringy things you know like it's the other stuff um because i i really enjoy predators too as well but there's just so much of it that I'm like, uh, okay, we're just going to fast forward through that because mm-hmm. I just, my brain can't, I can't have this. I just can't right now. Um, but I really do enjoy the world building. I thought it was so cool to see them actually be, I mean, I know we get to see them be predators in Predator, 
but it, I think the sequel definitely expands on that. You get to see their cool ship and how they really hunt the uh, there's the collecting of the skulls and the spine attached. I just think there's mm. something so brutal about that, you know, something so animalistic and, and rudimentary, you know, about doing that. And it's almost like collecting trophies. It's just, there's something really cool about that. And it seems absurd for them to go to the city, but even that made sense to me too, you know, to leave the jungle and go somewhere more populated and see how the predators handle that environment. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a more rewatchable film in my opinion too. I, I love Arnold Schwarzenegger it's the the get it to the chopper. I can't. I I wasn't gonna do <laughs> the uh, the impression, but I couldn't help myself. It I happened. just had to. I know I did. I'm sorry. Uh, I I love all of that, but Predators too. I I definitely could sit down and watch that way more times. For and, sure. And one final note: if you want to see something that will make you chuckle. Um, for anybody that's listening, go onto YouTube and just do a search for Danny Glover Predators Dance. And it's just kind of a behind the scenes thing that they did that's kind of been making the rounds lately. Um, if you want to see Danny Glover dance with a bunch of people who are in full Predator garb, it's uh, it's fun to watch. So I definitely recommend it. Ooh, it's it's that. good to know that the people in the Predator costume like didn't do the method thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh wow! Oh, this is fun. <laughs> well, Derek, I'm gonna move it over to you. It's your uh, second pick. Tell us what it is. Set it up for us. What, what, what are we? What are we feeling at the drive-in? We just had Hocus Pocus. Okay. A lot, a lot of kids, so, you know, a lot of people are happy. There's some scared kids. It's time to traumatize a generation. Uh, so oh, dear. I'm oh, going. God. So it's, the sun has gone down. It's time to go a little more dark. But not, not like super dark, but just, you know, make things a little more edgy. And this one's also a sequel, but instead of a number two, it's a number four. And the movie is Halloween for the return of Michael Myers, mm -hmm. which hmm. I know might be a little confusing to just throw that out there in the middle of a movie marathon without <laughs> without Halloween's <laughs> one, two or three. I guess you wouldn't necessarily need three in this case, but I feel like it's a movie that you can just jump into regardless, just because it kind of restarts the franchise on on a different a little bit later. And it's, you know it's not like Halloween one or two where you necessarily need to follow up one with the other. So I think we're okay with that. But the reason I chose it is because I feel like this movie maybe out of all the Halloween movies, I know this is kind of maybe a little controversial, but I feel like it, it embodies the autumn season, perhaps the best. Like I feel like the opening credits and I've seen this on this discussion on Twitter. I feel like I'm not the only one where this movie just immediately brings to mind like a Midwestern fall flavor. And I feel like the settings of it, like it really leans into the trick or treating the most out of any Halloween movie. And you've got the, the, uh, I don't know. It just feels like there's a lot more of a Halloween night vibe to it. And it, it, it just kind of embodies that with the visuals and, with Jamie in the clown costume and it kind of harkens back to the original Halloween in a lot of ways while still, still doing its own thing. And I'm kind of biased too, because I saw Halloween's four and five way more than the original Halloween growing up, just because AMC on the fear fest always played those two back to back over and over and over again. And I just, I really loved them. I, I, I still love them. And I know it's maybe not the, it, maybe not the most high quality Halloween movie, but it's one of my favorites. And I feel like it just kind of brings to mind a fall Michael Myers flavor. So for that reason, it's my number two in my movie marathon. Let's see. So part four has 
Danielle Harris, right? In it, she's a little, a little girl. Yep. Okay, because for some reason, I always, I, I feel like I, the theme, my second theme, is confusion. <laughs> Because I I sometimes get four and five confused. <laughs> like I, I almost know. did just talking about it to be honest. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Because there's things that overlap as far as the plot goes in both of them. So I thought, okay, Daniel Harris, all right, all right, got it. Yes, and that's true because you definitely um, there's definitely more of a focus on the uh, kids in their costumes and, and the main characters too, the, um, and their costumes and them trick or treating. So yeah, I totally get that. You would, you would think that with a franchise called Halloween, <laughs> you know, that there would be somewhat of a focus on, you know, like the actual rituals of, of the holiday, but yeah, no, I never thought about it like that. Honestly, I never really ever thought about the the lack of focus on trick or treating. That's so that's wild. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I feel like I mean I know the original Halloween. You know they have the Tommy scene and and there's definitely the costumes and that. But I feel like this one actually spends the most time like out and about on Halloween night. And I know I think Rob Zombie's remake of Halloween did that a little bit too, but I feel like this one, this one just feels like the most Halloween to me, which is maybe a little weird to say, but it just, if it's the most Halloweeny of the Halloweens. No, I mean, I, yeah, I think that makes sense. It's, um, no, it's, it's a great movie and it's a great pick. Yeah. I don't think, and you're definitely not alone in thinking that it's the more fall of the, the sequels. In fact, I think it was, um, I think Heather talked in a, uh, uh, a while ago in, in a, uh, an episode about how like those opening credits, like just instantly kind of put her into a fall feeling, um, you know, and the, the original Halloween for as classic as it is, it's, you know, Midwestern Halloween by way of, California, you know, there's palm trees in the background. So, um, you know, I can definitely see you if you, if you want that autumn feeling going more for, for four or five, where they really kind of capture what it actually autumn feels like. So, yeah, I, I definitely don't think you're alone at all. in, in, in thinking that this has more of a, uh, a Halloweeny feel. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, but I'm yeah, so let's move, uh, <laughs> let's move on it's to you, Tamika. Verb. It's, uh, it's your or adjective, your I should say. <laughs> so Tamika, we're on to, uh, to movie number two with you. It's, uh, what is, what's your second musical? I'm curious. Okay. Get excited for musical number two. It is now probably nine-ish. If this drive-in started at seven, actually a little after. No, no, it's like eight forty-five because the Nightmare Before Christmas is kind of short. Um, but yeah, it's dark, and maybe the kids are kind of you know tired. It's near their bedtime, so we're gonna we're gonna raise up the uh, the uh, advisory, the age advisory a little bit. With Repo, the genetic opera. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I Ooh promise we're going right in the rated R territory. <laughs> I, I promise that uh, the progression will make sense, I promise, because my next two picks, I think, will fit with Repo nicely, I hope. I, I did try to think this through. <laughs> but um, we, we get... I, I always, I'm always nervous that I'm going to mess up his name, but Daryl Lynn Boosman, Boosman, I always it's feel like Darren I'm, Lynn Bowsman. Bowsman. See, I always try to make it like French, like Boosman. I <laughs> mean, we, he I mean, may, somebody say, may prefer it that way. Can we say Boosman from now on? Cause that's more fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 you know, some people may like it that way. You know, I'm sorry, Darren. I I always, I don't know. I always want to try to like throw some flair onto it. Not that Bowsman is not full of flair. Um, but I, okay. So if you've never seen this uh, musical before, I feel like in a way it's kind of, well, I don't know. 
I wanted to say that I thought it was somewhat timely, but I, I wanted to take that back. But now that I think about things, I don't know, we might, we might get there, actually. <laughs> um, but this, it's set in the future, uh, about, I guess, like 30 years or so, maybe 40 um, at this point in time in 2020 into the future. And because um, a lot of people are in need of organs, there's like a company who, uh, like, I guess they facilitate organ transplants. And because they're expensive, uh, people, they put people on a payment plan. And if you obviously uh, fall, default on the payments, then, well, the repo man comes uh, to collect, you know, so it's like when you fall behind on like a payment for your car and then the repo man follows you around and then they like find it parked somewhere and they take it. So it's kind of like it's like that, but with organs. Uh, listen, I know I know what you're, you might be thinking, but it's fun. And again, like I said, bizarre. <laughs> 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 and I just think bizarre is fun. So, you know, can have a little adult fun. Kids are, you know, maybe they're sleeping, you know, you've got your alcoholic beverage, perhaps you get a little, um, oh, the cast. Oh, okay. Now this is very 2006. So I don't know if I can sell anyone on the cast uh, of uh, Paris Hilton, but if you are in your uh, mid-ish 30s and you remember her and her heyday of the uh, mid-2000s, you know, she's in this. I forget if this was her first movie or if it was House of Wax. Uh, I, I think she'd done House of Wax before that. And I, I really liked her in that movie, too. Yeah, yeah, there's some really great gore in that movie. But you get Bill Mosley as well, a legend. Um, I believe Paul Sorvino, which is just shocking. I, I I actually respect him more, if that's even possible. When you know, he's in this. I love that when just actors just decide, you know what? Let's do it. Uh, I got nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be super fun, but yeah. I how do you guys feel? Have, have any of you seen this this movie at all, or is this like totally bizarre that I went from the nightmare before no, Christmas? No, I, I I actually had a uh, a friend my, my friend and I had this movie poster like printed out and in our uh, locker in high school. And I remember it, it would be a couple of years before I finally saw it, but it was like, man, this is, seems so out there. And like Paris Hilton is in this. And of course she was everywhere during that time period. So it was kind of like, whoa, what's she doing in this really bizarre movie? Like I need to see what's going on here. And so I remember this movie really well. It's been a, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I remember really digging it. And it kind of had like this, twisted rocky horror picture show vibe to it like it just was very its own thing and i i think uh i think it would be perfect for the drive-in yeah, i'll be honest i haven't seen this one not necessarily because like i'm not interested it's just one of those ones that just never really happened um but i am intrigued by the idea of um a, a, a musical with anthony stewart head in the lead um you know anything with uh, giles from buffy the vampire slayer uh is is something that's bound to be interesting um another interesting thing that like i do remember when this came out it it i think it kind of suffered a little bit from that thing that happens in Hollywood from time to time where two movies that are basically about the same thing, even if they wind up being very different movies, come out at the same time. And right around the time this was coming out, there was a similarly plotted movie called Repo Men. I think it was like Jude Law. Um, and I forget who is. It might have been Forrest Whitaker. I forget who the other person oh, was. Yep. Forrest Whitaker. Um, yep. And it's, it was the same basic premise where it's kind of like this future uh, where people get, um, you know, organ replacements on 
you know, financed. And if they can't pay it, then people will come and take them back. Um, and I think they took a more like weird buddy cop movie uh, vibe to it for that. So it just like weird, like as, as over the top and wacky as this premise sounds, the fact that like two movies at the same time came out about that just kind of blows my mind when I think about it. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, interestingly, oh, I... I didn't see Repo Men, but I did see Repo, the genetic opera. Um, I haven't seen it since the first time I saw it, and I can't remember where I saw it. I don't remember if I saw it in theaters or we rented it or it was in the road show. I know we did the Devil's Carnival road show, but I can't remember if we did Repo. But um, I do remember there's a lot of catchy songs. Um, I do remember that we had a good time when we saw it. I think this it definitely reminds me that like even it, th- I would have done it as well for Nightmare Before Christmas, but for Repo and everything else as well. I imagine at your drive in Tamika that we're all singing along, that our windows are down, and that um, that, that the whole crowd is just singing along to uh, to this. this. This is definitely a catchy one. I, I that was my in perfect harmony. My, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my goal. I I I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to be a good drive-in director. I think yeah. we've all been good drive-in directors by the way. I think so. And um and with that, I will move on to my second pick, which is going to be, you know, we have our invasion theme. We started with critters um and uh and we're, we're moving right on you know i even though it was you know as a revelation to me it was pg-13 um but i still think you know critters was was kind of harder um for our audience we didn't go necessarily for a a, a kid-friendly marathon we're just if kids want to sneak in or parents want to take their kids you're welcome to but um so we're moving right along to life force and life force is going to be my second pick um it's a movie that you know i've talked about many times on the podcast um thanks to patrick i had kind of overlooked this i think i had seen it when i was younger and i was like eh. and um you know and it wasn't until you know, just really hearing about, you know, Patrick's passion for all things Toby Hooper. Then I'm like, oh, let me let me give Life Force another try. And I fell in love with it. And um, since then, it's been a regular watch for me. Um, I think it's really cool in that it kind of melds different subgenres into a single one. You know, we have the beginning when they encounter the space vampire And um, that's reminiscent of Alien. Of course, Dan O'Bannon was a writer on this. And then, you know, we have the, um, you know, then we have the, like, incarceration or the, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? The, like, medical scenes. Um, We have the breakout. And then we have, like, a full, like, invasion or plague or whatever you want to call it. And um, without going into too many details intentionally, um, I think this movie has a lot of surprises. Um, I think, you know, as, as, you know, Toby Hooper kind of does, he, um, you know, kind of, kind of takes this in unexpected areas. And, um, and I think it's a journey that's, that's, that is worth everybody taking. Um, like I said, I think this is kind of underseen. And, um, and yeah, I don't want to give a lot away because I just know that usually when I talk about this, not too many people have seen it. So I'm going to subject my entire um, drive-in audience to this, and, uh, and hopefully they love it. That seems like the perfect drive-in movie because a lot of people, I know we've definitely talked about a lot of Toby Hooper movies on Corpse Club and Daily Dead and... I know Patrick Bromley is a huge Toby Hooper fan, probably the biggest Toby Hooper fan on earth. And I feel like this is still one of the more underseen movies of his, but also of the eighties horror scene too. Like when you're talking about space vampires, you just feel like that would have gotten a little more love. And I think people have come around on it, but there's still, there's still a lot of people that need to tap into it. And, it, and, and, I think it's got that iconic image of like the totally drained body and the, the dry corpse that just, it's like the imagery of it is so great for the big screen and for the drive-in screen that I think this will, this would be a really cool pick for a drive-in movie marathon. 
I mean, I think they just really didn't know how to market this movie. I'm speculating. Um, but I don't know if the <laughs> name is really, it, it really helps sell it. I don't think, you know, if you look at the poster, the promotional materials, the, the trailer, I, I think this movie at the time was so weird that they just didn't necessarily know how do we sell it. I honestly think mm-hmm. they should have called it the Space Vampire. Right. Because it's think based it on made, a book called The Space yeah, Vampires. I think it made <laughs> so, much more sense. And I know that that right. kind of sounds like, you know, a 50s throwback. But there were a lot of 50s throwbacks. I mean, you have like Night of the Creeps and you have Invaders from Mars. And so, I mean, I I don't think that this feels like too out there. Um, I definitely think that the marketing was kind of like at least the start of the problems here. I don't think there's anything wrong with the movie. I, I really don't. Spread the um, word. And I, for one, yeah. will say, I guess it was not appropriately marketed to me because I have not seen it yet. So uh, you have done a good job at uh, at nudging me towards it. However, uh, between you and Patrick, I, th- I think it's finally time for me to uh, to give this one a gander. Yeah, do it. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, so that's uh, that's my second movie. And now we're taking a brief intermission because we take an intermission as long as the last one. <laughs> we'll be here for a long time. People will fall asleep. <laughs> um, whether it's our listeners or us, we may not make the fourth movie, as like I said, as often happens. So we'll go quick with this one. This one we, we did candy last time. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna do drinks this time. So um, you know, I will I'll I'll start it off and I'll just go very quickly and I'll talk about you know what I like to have at the drive-in or while watching a movie. Um, when I was younger, it probably was ices. You know, I'd have the ices at the theater. And I'm, I'm really just like complaining about Regal and the, the longer or the older I got, and I don't think it was like I got older. So, you know, it, it just didn't, you know, it wasn't as good as when I was young because, you know, that's how I remembered it. No, like the, the ICs, like they went with like kind of like different brands. They got watery and really had just like this like warm slushy thing. And it doesn't matter how many theaters I go to. I feel like I don't get a proper icy. <laughs> so anyway, but that was how my... Do you, how could you possibly serve a warm slushy? That's just... It's liquid. It's it not is, even it's, icy anymore. Yeah, so you're basically just drinking syrup, and uh, it's like it doesn't even last mm. you through the trailers, and it's disgusting. <laughs> if if it were a proper icy like I used to get back in the day, and you can still get it. You go to the fair, you go, and actually, I've I've marked where the best icies are. Damn, I'm taking this off. <laughs> I don't care. The best icy I've had in years at the right temperature that will last you through the entire drink without it turning into like liquid at the bottom was at universal in Florida. For some reason mm. they had like the, cause they'll have those little stands in my experience. And I keep trying ICs to find good ones. You can't, you can't get them at the theater, at least not at Regal, but universal had the best. I was like, okay, like I, I went to the bottom of this and there is no, it's not liquid. It's like, I hate it. Anyway, that's what I used to drink all the time. Um, and I'm going to stop there because I'll just keep going. <laughs> so we'll, we'll move on. Um, Tamika, what's your, what's your go-to drink? Okay. This might seem kind of weird, but unsweetened iced tea. With like a couple you squirts monster. of lemon. I listen, Ooh. I know, but it is so good. I know it's an acquired taste. Perhaps, but I have acquired it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And everywhere I go, if I'm in the mood for tea, that's what I order. And it's, I've never had like a really bad experience. So I, I'm with Jonathan on that, like with the icy, like it's just got to be a certain. Like, it's got to be a certain amount of lemons, like a, a certain amount of lemon squeezes, I mean. Um, so it's like a good balance between how, like, kind of, I don't want to say tart it is, the tea is, but, like, it's kind of n- not sweet. <laughs> how not sweet it is. Yeah, it's, you don't want a sweet tea. There's a very big difference. Yeah. Oh, I love sweet- I love that flavor the unsweetened because you get the caffeine without getting like too sugary. So it's a nice balance. Yeah, Derek. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) See, my 
My problem is growing up in South Central Pennsylvania, um, the quote unquote iced tea in that area is Turkey Hill iced tea, which mm -hmm. if anyone's ever had it, it's not iced tea. It's brown punch, basically. Like it's just brown sugar water. Um, I think it, they, <laughs> they might have dropped a tea leaf in it at one point in the process, but it is just a sugary tea drink more than anything else. And so like growing up on that, when you then drink actual like unsweetened brewed iced tea, it's it's not like it, it, you just you don't taste anything. That's fair. Mm, OK. It's like a new, a different mm. flavor of soda, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say now that I'm getting older and like, you know, your body chemistry kind of starts to veer away from stuff that's like too over the top. Um, yeah. I am finding that like I'm inching towards actually enjoying unsweetened iced tea and, and Turkey Hill iced tea is just, it's way too much. Mm. <laughs> uh -oh. yeah, if your hands are I mean, shaking by the end of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. There we Unlined. go. I like it. I'm with you. Yeah, Turkey <laughs> Hill iced tea is it's a lot. It it reminds me of um Sunny D. You know how like sweet like Sunny D That is, is a perfect that is perfect. Um Turkey Hill iced tea is the iced tea what Sunny D is the orange juice. Yes. <laughs> mm. In that Sunny D is not orange juice and Turkey Hill iced tea is not iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> All natural. Oh, no, <laughs> All true. All true statements. <laughs> mm. You know, I, I mean, I, I would go, I would definitely like the unsweetened iced tea for, for a drive-in experience because you're going to need that caffeine to get you through four movies. If I didn't have that option and I, I you know, as a kid, I love the icy thing, like the blue and the red icy. But the problem was that like after the first couple of slurps, like it was like that was there goes the flavor. Then you're just stuck with ice for the rest of the cup. And you just spent like eight dollars on it. So wait, what kind of ices always... did you have? You oh, just... you know what? You, you are right, though. But that again, it's a bad icy. You haven't had a good icy then. Mm, probably not. You, Probably you shouldn't not. be. You I, should not be drinking all the syrup out of it and just end up with ice. A Jonathan, proper icy is is mixed together. It's like a perfect blend, so that every sip is both syrup mm. and ice. I love that Jonathan is an icy snob. <laughs> like I'm, I'm picturing his basement has like a map with like little pinpoints in it for all the places to actually get like a good icy in the in the United States. <laughs> I realize how crazy Stay. this is starting to sound, but I'm going to, I'm going to double down on this, but yeah. So yeah, if you're, if you have an icy okay. where you, it, it is just ice okay. and you don't have like a mix, then something's wrong with it. <laughs> going to do a well, short intermission, <laughs> AKA 20 minutes on ices and iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But I, I would say, well, before theater shut down, I would, what I was going to for like my go-to was like an angry orchard hard cider just because I was, it, it didn't like put me to sleep, but it, so it was kind of, you know, it was a little bit of, I don't know. It just had that sugar, uh, that sugar apple flavor, but it, it didn't put me to sleep. And it kind of gave me like a little bit of an uptick to get me through a movie. So I, I was kind of, that was my go-to as opposed to like a regular beer or something like that. It was just like, Oh, okay. I'll have a hard cider and it'll, it's kind of like having a pop, but a little bit extra. And, it's, and that was kind there. of my go-to. Yeah. I hope somebody else is driving home. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, we're not, uh, we're not messing around here. So <laughs> no, I know. Well, well I mean, corpse club, corpse club listeners, <laughs> longtime corpse club listeners know that, you know, that you've been present after more than a few ciders. You've, you've talked about it. So. <laughs> True. And yeah. as someone who has traditionally watched movies the day we've talked about them, that's probably the same day too. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I guess right. I would go with that. But you can't beat like a giant Dr Pepper or something like that either. You know, it's it, I th when I think of blockbuster movies, I think of over overpriced soda and just ungodly expensive popcorn and and just getting robbed at the concession stand and then going and watching things blow up on screen. <laughs> That's part That's of the experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, okay, Brian, <laughs> we're moving on to you. 
Uh, mine's pretty simple. I just like to treat myself to a nice cherry Coke. Um, you know, I don't like to overdo the cherry Coke just because I like to keep my teeth. So, you know, usually I'll keep that to <laughs> kind of an event drink. And that's usually when I'm doing something like, like going to the movies or something like that. Nope. Nice. Can I ask you this? Have you tried the cherry Dr. Pepper or is that a little too much? Um, I have, and I like Dr. Pepper and I like cherry. So you would think I'd like the combination. It's fine. It's not quite my speed. Um, okay. Yeah. Usually I'll, if I'm going to go a cherry flavor, I'll usually go cherry Coke. I, I yeah. like it. Okay. But not so, lime Coke. No, thank no, you. No, no, no. Nobody likes that. <laughs> I will not be putting the lot. Well, that lasted for what? Like, seven days and then they realized it was a horrible idea it was one magical summer <laughs> <laughs> let's not shortchange it it was one magical summer and that was all that was all that we were worthy of is what it was <laughs> that's the way i remember it it was too i didn't good. have it anyway, but i can't that's... imagine it tastes like fresh lime like i can understand like if you get if you get a cocktail that has coke and when I was younger, I made the mistake of getting cocktails that had Coke in them. <laughs> Sometimes I'd put like a lime wedge, and I imagine it, it didn't taste as good as that. But, yeah, no thank you. Uh, okay, let's let's move on to uh, to movie three. Our intermission is over. Um, so we're, we're on our third two um, with you, Brian. Um, what, what's your pick and what's the, what's the, what's the mood like? How's everybody doing after movie two? So I, I feel like people are ready to start getting a little dark. Um, and in fact, this is going to be the darkest movie of the night. Um, so it's going to be one, let's, let's buckle in a little bit and we're going to go with pet cemetery two. And Ooh. all respect to Mary Lambert for taking a movie like pet cemetery that features like child death, a guy losing his whole family, a guy by the end of it probably getting murdered by his reanimated corpse wife and saying, how can I make this both meaner and funnier? And that's what Pet Cemetery 2 is. Like it is such a dark and just mean spirited movie. Um, you know, uh, Clancy Brown's uh, Sheriff Gus alone is just like every horrible thing this guy can do. He does even before he becomes kind of the the reanimated corpse version of himself. Um but it's also just got like this really dark, demented sense of humor. Um, the, the, the scene in, that always sticks out in my head is like when at the end, like uh, everything's kind of hitting the fan and um, a, an interestingly cast Anthony Edwards is kind of, you know, he plays the dad and he's going at it with this reanimated corpse of, of, of Gus Clancy Brown's character. And like, he gets a drill to the shoulder. He gets the crap beat out of him. And it's just like just this rough and tumble fight scene. And he finally kills uh, Gus. And there's that scene where like he's like kind of stumbling out of the house and you see him pause and he turns back in. And like you just hear his gun go off like three or four more times just to make sure like he finished the job. And it's just it's this. It's such a just this oddity of a movie. Um, and it's another one that I just remember seeing as a kid and just being both like completely enraptured with and also just completely like appalled by in, in how um, just over the top dark this movie gets. Um, I, I don't think it ever really caught on. Uh, I know it was a bit of a dud when it first came out. Um, I think it might be kind of hitting some of those like, you know, cult favorite circles right now. Um, is it, um, screen factory that just put out a, uh, a Blu-ray for it? Yeah, they did. Yes. So yeah, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to start catching on. Um, and it's just kind of that, you know, it's from 92, I believe like 91 or 92. Uh, and it's kind of just part of that weird early nineties era <laughs> where they were just trying everything they possibly could. And it just <laughs> produced a lot of really weird movies. And, and I think this is one of them. Yeah, th this movie, uh, I think you described it perfectly because I remember watching this. I think it was like on AMC Fear Fest for the first time. And it, it, it was 
actually probably more disturbing to me than the original Pet Cemetery, just because it seemed like something is off, like something, the whole vibe of the movie, there's this, this weirdness to it where something just feels wrong, but you can't quite put your finger on it. And the whole style is very, there's a little bit of like this grungy kind of merciless overtone to it. And I know the first Pet Cemetery is also very merciless, but there's just something, I don't know, like you said, experimental, early 90s, very of its time, but but re- in a good way. And I feel like it, it's just, it feels more dangerous in a way. It just feels really... I don't know, just just unnerving. So I, I love it for those reasons. And I love when there's like a sequel to a Stephen King uh, movie where like a movie based on a Stephen King work because it like it just expands on this world that Stephen King created. And his his stories have such potential for like all of these ideas to to co- to translate to film. And I feel like Pet Cemetery is one of those where it, it's kind of like Children of the Corn, where I think by now we could have seen like 20 pet cemetery movies if, if we wanted to, <laughs> but I, I'm glad that at least the second one exists because it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and I think the later you watch it at night, the weirder it gets. And so I, I like the, uh, the placement as the third film. Yeah. Pet cemetery two is kind of like what would happen if the original pet cemetery died and you buried it in the pet cemetery <laughs> and like, this is what would come out. That's a great way to oh, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> they need to put that on the uh, on the Ooh. back of the. We'll just send back the Blu-ray and <laughs> reprint the case. <sighs> that is good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, Derek, let me mo- move on to you, and um, you're October festing it. Let's um, mm-hmm. again. It's it's movie three. Tell us how the how the, how is the atmosphere at your drive-in marathon? How are the how are the kids? How are the adults doing? And what's your third movie? Well, the kids aren't all right because they just watched a very unsettling ending to Halloween Four with the scissors and the bathtub and just, in my opinion, one of the best horror movie cliffhangers. Even though they didn't really follow up on it in Halloween Five, but. I really love that ending to Halloween four It kind of ends things on a downer note, but it's like, it's genuinely shocking if you've never seen it before. So I want to continue on that momentum. We're going to keep things creepy, but also a little more fun and festive. And we're going to really dig into the Halloween atmosphere for the third film, which is Michael Doherty's trick or treat. And this is my pumpkin spice. You might say it's the basic pumpkin spice like Halloween movie that you could think of because it's so obvious, but I, I think that's why I have to include it in my fall flavor, fall fling, whatever I'm calling this movie marathon, because it just oozes Halloween night. I mean, this is, I think arguably the greatest Halloween movie we've seen released and it just gets better with age. And I think it, it, from the Halloween decorations, the anthology, which every single segment, is I think just perfect and really digs into the Halloween spirit in a different way, which I really like from vintage Halloween to more modern Halloween and everything in between. Uh, I just love this movie. I think it's, it's another kind of example of like a classic Midwestern Halloween feeling to it. And the production design is phenomenal. I think they just knocked it out of the park when you're talking about that, I guess, classic suburban small town Halloween, uh, style. So yeah, I, I, I really, I really think, uh, this will be a good one to kind of, you know, let people have some fun, but also still creep them out a little bit with Sam, who is a very mis kind of like a gremlin. He's mischievous, but he'll also cut your head off if you, if you cross him. So, uh, yeah, I think it, I think it fits well with, uh, with this movie marathon. This oh, is a great one. Sam. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of those movies that, you know, I would, I would say, you know, obviously there's some objectionable content. It depends on how, how you feel as a parent. I'm not a parent. I'm not going to judge either way, but I think it would be cool to show this to not really young kids, but like 
kids because <laughs> there is like <laughs> there is a fun to this movie even though it does go dark there is somewhat of like uh make sure to celebrate halloween otherwise sam's gonna get you he'll do this to you but he won't if you keep the halloween spirit alive in your heart um and um so it it I think it is like it almost is done in a way kind of like Krampus was. It's kind of done in a way, and, and that one's PG thirteen. But that's kind of done in a way where like we should show younger people trick or treat. <laughs> I, I feel like trick or treat is the movie that like the parents kind of like quote unquote accidentally like leave out and look the other way while like their twelve or thirteen year old <laughs> picks it up and goes and watches it. Like kind of gives them that kind of naughty like this isn't something I should be watching. But ultimately it's not anything that's like really going to like warp them as a kid. Yeah, I think that's yeah. about a, a good time because that's when people start being like, I'm too adult to wear costumes or I'm too adult to celebrate Halloween. Mm-hmm. So this is that's a good time to be like, Sam's gonna kill you. <laughs> but he'll be and really if, cute when he does it right with that the lollipop and the burlap sack and everything and i feel like if you if you start watching it like after the opening scene and then the principal scene and then you started with like the the bus massacre segment which i know still sounds horrifying but i think if you start from that point it actually is mostly like young like a younger viewer friendly because I mean, you're skipping like the cyanide and the beheading and all that stuff. And from that point on, it's actually not too gory, but I feel like those first like 20 minutes and I don't know if Doherty was just like, we're not effing around. So we're just going to put this right out there right away. And I think it works for the movie as, as like an adult watching it. But I feel like you could almost just say, all right, we're going to start like 20 minutes in. And it's, it's pretty family friendly. I mean, yeah, we'll go with that. Except for the werewolf boobs. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, I mean, I said pretty family friendly. <laughs> if you're aiming to be a cool parent, then it's family friendly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, any movie is family friendly depending on the family. Yeah, exactly. As I said, I'm not going to well, judge if you're going yeah. yeah, If you're like, my kids saw this when they were five, I'm be like, okay, yeah, it's it's up to you. Um, so. Uh, Tamika, we're going to move on to you. We're on musicals. Um, everybody rocked out to repo and, um, Mm -hmm. we're on to movie three. So what's the vibe like and and what's the movie? So I feel like somehow our, our picks are in sync with each other because Brian went kind of dark and so did I, uh, although I know it seems like, well, all of these are kind of dark if you really think about it, but Sweetie Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good one. I feel like once we start getting into chopping up people and feeding them to other people, well, that's pretty dark. Um, but still fun, you know, because I still want the crowd to have fun. You know, maybe they're starting to doze off a little bit, although I don't know how on earth you did that after a repo, but it happens. I won't judge. And so I thought, you know, the something like somewhat calmer, because I think there's something about Tim Burton films that are calm. I don't know if that's the right word, but they are kind of like morbidly relaxed. Put that on a movie poster. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, it'll it'll be. You know, if you were really worn out by repo and you need like a breather, this is kind of that. Um, But if you're kind of starting to doze off, you know, uh, maybe repo wasn't your thing. I can bring you back with Sweeney Todd, you know. Uh, I just think it is such a lovely film. And I, I remember the first time I saw it in theaters and... It's one of the few theater experiences I remember. Um, so I love that. I've kind of like, okay, well, all right. So uh, I, again, I love the songs and almost every one of them are really good. I especially love Down by the Sea. Um, Helena Bonham Carter, again, it's a great cast. Um, oh, Sasha Baron Cohen. I, I don't know if this was like before or after Borat, but this he it was such a surprise to see him in a semi-serious role and to hear him 
like like to see his range you know i mean i i i always knew he had range but to see him in a musical and to be over the top but it's still muted so it still kind of feels like a real person i just was really surprised by him uh and yeah, it, it, it's always interesting to see, like, every once in a while, Sasha Baron Cohen will, like, remind people that he can act. Um, yes. You know, and that the, the shtick he's putting out with his characters is just that, it's shtick. Um, and that, you know, if, if called to, he can actually do, like, you know, dramatic roles. Oh, yeah, for sure. And he's he can a good actor. sing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, at one point he was up for uh, Freddie Mercury in that... Um and that queen right. um, biopic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Ah, oh, interesting. What would that have looked like? Alternate mm-hmm. timeline. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I haven't seen Sweeney Todd since it came out to theaters. I actually, we almost rewatched it just a week or so ago. So I feel like it's, it's coming up in the rotation. Um, I remember... You know, kind of like many Tim Burton movies, but I just remember that um, that it, it looked gorgeous. I remember there's that mm-hmm. like, there's that like, um, what do you call it? There's like that outdoor scene where they're on the dock. And I just, there's, uh, it's, uh, for whatever reason, that like, just the, the, the cinematography, the, the design, the costume, it, like, that always stands out to me and like how perfectly um, you can place these characters that don't seem like they belong in a scene like that and yet it all kind of works and it all kind of looks beautiful and like in in tim burton's you know weird vision for the the world and i mean i I just watched beetlejuice again just am amazed at, at his eye and how how he can you know bring his vision to the screen and how different it looks from you know from everybody else yeah it feels very like tim burtony for sure (laughs) And the funny thing about Sweeney Todd is that uh, I'm like you, um, Jonathan. I haven't seen it. I saw it in theaters, and I haven't seen it since. the The scene in it that's kind of that that really kind of gets me the most isn't even a scene that's like it, it's a movie where you know people get eaten, people get thrown into furnaces, people get their throats slit left and right. The thing that always gets me is actually the scene between him and Sasha Baron Cohen where they're kind of having that shave off. Because I have gotten one and I will only get one straight razor shave in my life. I got it the day I got married and they had to Photoshop out the absolute like butcher job this person did. I have very, I have very sensitive skin and very coarse hair. So it, Mm -hmm. it just like my neck looked like someone took one of those old timey lawnmowers and just dragged it back and forth over it for a while. So I am, yeah, I am not. I, every time I see a scene with someone getting a straight razor shave, I just like have like flashbacks to, to that day. And I'm just like, Oh God, no. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was not good. Um, so yeah, anything and, and, you know, to, to then also take that to that's, you know, horrible conclusion where, you know, he's not just given a bad shave. He's actually slitting people's throats. That, uh, that's one that gets me. Not a fun memory to recall, but hopefully the rest of the wedding day went well and, and you didn't have your throat slit, so that's good. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so we, I remember th- there is a this was a big movie release, too, because I remember this came out right before Christmas. And it was like one of those movies that everyone saw on on like uh, holiday vacation. And then everyone would come back and talk about it. And Tim Burton, just se- it, it just feels like prime Tim Burton. I guess you would say like the second second wave of Tim Burton because he had the 80s and 90s. And this is really him like dominating the two thousands and, and kind of, kind of finding himself again, I think. So yeah, this is a, this is a great kind of like a classic, I guess, a neo classic Tim Burton pick. Yeah. Good pick. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we're moving on and, um, we're back to my invasion drive in marathon and, um, we've seen critters. We had everybody see life force. And um, I always like for movie four and I always like for this to kind of be a badge of honor where it's like we know we're going to lose a lot of people no matter what we put on. So we might as well, you know, 
we might as well give them a little bit of a, a tough viewing for uh, for movie three and then kind of reward them with movie four. So that's what I'm doing. Um, not that I dislike this movie at all. Um, and that is I Married a Monster from Outer Space from 1958. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine at this point, you know, not too many people have, um, have seen it. It was a double bill with the blob, which really kind of helped propel this movie's popularity. And it's a great companion piece to Invasion of the Body Snatchers for anyone who hasn't seen it. It deals with, um, a woman who's played by, uh, Gloria Talbot and, she's starting to sense that there's something wrong with her husband and uh, turns out that he's been replaced by an alien and there is a plot to replace many of the male population with aliens so that they can repopulate their species. And um, so to figure out what happens and whether, uh, you know, uh, our heroine is able to save the day or uh, if the world's taken over by aliens, um, you'll have to watch it for yourself. But um, yeah, this one's, uh, like I said, this one's fun. It's, um, you know, I, I think and, and many movies kind of deal with this, but I think it's it's interesting the, you know, the, what do you call it? Like the underlying theme or taking away the sci-fi. It's like, you're not the person I married. And <laughs> this is dealing with that. Well, hey, well, the person you married has now become an alien. And um, so, yeah, so this is this is my pick. It's, um, I don't know how easy it is to watch these days. I think it might be on Prime. I used to watch it regularly on VHS. My mom had... You know, maybe she had taped it off a TV. I don't remember what else was on there. It's possible it was either Invasion of the Body Snatchers or The Day the Year Stood Still or both. And then this. So, um, yeah, so I've seen this one quite a bit. And I actually haven't seen it in a while. So I'm, I'm planning on uh, on revisiting soon. So, Jonathan, I got to hand it to you. Not only have you come up with a movie that I haven't seen, this is the rare movie that I've never even heard of before. So you're you're definitely going with a uh, I don't know if it's a deep cut or just a, a random blind spot of mine. But yeah, this is uh, I, I, I'm really wanting to go to your your evening of movies because it's going to be a lot of stuff either I haven't seen for a very long time or I haven't seen at all. Yeah, and likewise for me, this is one I'm not familiar with, and just looking at it. Uh, it looks like it's the same director as I was a teenage werewolf. So that's pretty interesting. So, uh, but yeah, I have not seen this one, so I need to purchase a ticket to this drive-in movie marathon and correct that. Well, it's time to make it a, a triple. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's definitely it's a fun one. It's I, and like I said, I think it's a short run time as well. So yeah, I highly recommend this one if you can uh, can find it. Definitely seek it out. Um, but yeah, with with that, we're uh, we're gonna have another brief. I'm not even gonna use that anymore. We're gonna have another <laughs> intermission <laughs> before we get to our fourth movie. And um, you know what I did want to talk about a little bit was um, you know we're, we're talking about the you know the kind of rebirth of the drive-in, um, which I think is fantastic. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I know that not everyone has a chance to go to the drive-in. Maybe there's not a drive-in there. Maybe, um, you know, in some cases, um, some drive-ins maybe don't have um, as much social distancing as others. So I can understand maybe you don't want to go to the drive-in. Um, the ones that I've been to, they what they did was they removed the extra, um, it, they would have like these spaces that fit two cars, they'd remove one. Um, so it was only one car to a space. And so we felt very comfortable when we did it. Um, but if you don't, you may want to just have a drive-in or have a, an event, um, or screening or marathon or whatever at your own home. And so I've noticed that some people have been asking like, Hey, like, what do you recommend for my setup? And this might be for someone to, you know, either have a, um, you know, their own kind of like drive in night where you can kind of project to your, you know, um, garage door or, you know, the back of your house or, um, you know, a, a spot on, the, you know, if you're in an apartment complex, there may be, um, or a shared, um, shared building, there may be like a little spot where you can project to, or maybe just in your own house. Um, there, there's some different options, but I've seen people come up with all kinds of different setups or ask like, Hey, what do I need to do? And so, 
I did want to talk about that for a little bit. And then, um, you know, if any of my co-hosts have anything they want to add, any tips or tricks, feel free to do that as well. Um, but you know, I mean, I would say that if you're looking to, to come up with, um, you know, I, I think the big thing to do is figure out your budget, right? How much do you have to spend towards this endeavor? Say, I want to have like, you know, theater quality, you know, audio, video, the works. Well, you know, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars. And so you have to, you know, kind of make sure to keep your expectations in check. But also there are places you can go to get, you know, really high quality items at a relatively low cost. So just keep that in mind. And, um, and I think then understanding what are you going to use a projector for? Is it, do you want, you know, bleeding edge tech? Do you want, you know, 4k or HDR or are you okay with, you know, Blu-ray quality? And, um, you know, are you going to play video games? Do you want to, you know, have, you know, the PS5 plugged into it? Well, then again, you're going to use, you're going to go 4k. So let's talk about, um, if you're going to, you know, scale down and I would say a great resource, not not the only resource, but a great resource is wire cutter. Um, the wire cutter, if you go to their home theater recommendations, they have, you know, premium picks, budget picks, and they kind of break down all the different, um, options. And so, you know, I know I've mentioned before that I do have a a home theater, um, in my basement and I've been working on it like a little piece at a time, but the good news is, is it starting is relatively inexpensive. Um, a hundred inch projector screen is like a couple hundred dollars. And for $500, I think you can get like a BenQ, um, 1080 projector. So if you want to just project Blu-rays, you're good in the like $500 sub $1,000 range. And, um, with that, and it comes with speakers on it, but you can also plug speakers into it, add a tuner. And then again, if you want to get a home theater in a box, you're at a hundred dollars or two. If you want to put every piece together, right? Individual speakers and tuner, you can cost thousands of dollars so just know you have a range um you know but i would say you know for under a thousand dollars you can have you know a, a screen and uh, a projector and a home theater s- set up and you can use that you know if you want to have people over and again have a socially a dis- distanced event you can project it outside and project it on a wall you don't even if you don't want the projector screen just get a sheet um you could do it with a sheet it just depends on what kind of quality you're looking for um But I have seen a number of people who have done that, Um, you know, and then recently I have um, been experimenting with, I used um, an Optima, um, was it a UHD 50X? And so, you know, those are for gaming and those are for 4K. And so I've been using that to do like to test out like HDR content. Um, And, um, you know, and so so it's been fun to kind of like experiment with different things. We have movie nights. um, And so that's why, you know, I, I, I definitely it's something I'm passionate about because I enjoy the, you know, audio and, and visual setup and being able to say, well, how can I kind of replicate what I have at the theater? Um, but also because, you know, it's somewhere where my family can go that's different, right? Um, you know, my parents, they're quarantined at their home. They've spent, you know, eight months there, or nine months. They want to go, um, somewhere else. And so they can go to, you know, my basement, set up kind of like a little movie theater. And, um, you know, when you think about how much you pay for tickets, it's really a small price. Um, and you can, you know, make some little upgrades here and there and, uh, and set up a home theater. So, um, we've been having fun with that and watching, you know, movies on the big screen and, um, it's been a way to keep things a little more sane. And so I know as people are, you know, looking for things to do, especially as it gets colder, um, you know, that might be an opportunity, whether you set it up in your basement or, um, you know, you, you do something outside depending on where you live. So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to, uh, like I said, give people some, some recommendations. Like I said, if you don't feel comfortable going to the drive-in, you can set up your own drive-in night. And, uh, like I said, and pick up some different components and just, you know, start small and build up over time. And if you want to replace things, you know, you can replace them over time, but, um, I think you can have a lot of fun. Like I said, even, like I said, the sub thousand dollar range, you get a big projector screen and, a, a um, projector and you can be watching Blu-rays and the quality is fantastic. And uh, just something that occurred to me that could be interesting if you have anybody in your either family or friend circle, anybody that would be in your bubble that's musically inclined uh, and you have access to a piano, get like one of those really old, like, you know, a a copy of Nosferatu or uh, Haxon going and get someone to accompany Mm -hmm. it with like live piano. Yes, that is uh, I used to work at a. uh, church in Minneapolis and uh it was like a hundred year old church and they had a, a really old pipe organ and they used to every Halloween season 
uh, they would show a screening of like Metropolis or Phantom of the Opera, and it would it would be with live uh, organ accompaniment, and that that was a huge draw. Like people love that, so I can only imagine that'd be fun to bring that home and do something like that on a smaller scale, but just as fun. That is such a cool idea, Brian. That reminds me of like something they would have done during like the silent film era, you know? That's so cool. And it makes it different and fun, fresh. And because I can't shut up about Salem Horror Fest, uh, part of me, I think, was thinking of that because if, if anybody does have uh, – if uh, they've been doing their their virtual deal, uh, their virtual festival, uh, and they're going into their second weekend, uh, part of that is they actually have um, – they're playing some of these silent movies, but they've uh, actually recruited people to do like a new live musical performance to go along with it. Um, so, you know, if, if that's something you're interested in, but maybe you don't have uh, someone who's in your circle that's musically inclined, uh, that might be a way to kind of get that fix and, and uh, you know, be able to hear something a little different with it. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of great, you know, th- there's a lot of great content from Salem Horror Fest. Um, including, um, Brian, why don't you tell them what you, what you did? We, we got to, we got to play it. Okay. It's pretty I, awesome. I swear to God, I didn't do this as like, no, a, you didn't, it, and, but I'm glad you brought it up because then it reminded me because yes. <laughs> so yes, um, I am actually, uh, presenting, uh, at Salem Horror Fest this year. Um, so to, to just to give people a, an idea on kind of how it's working, they're doing this, this virtual kind of buffet of content. So there's different, uh, panels, there's a uh, movie premiere. There's uh, some different lectures and things like that, which you can see on demand uh, based off of like you can either get an all access uh, pass for the year and just get you know, access to all the content between now and, uh, next year's event. Um, or you can, you know, if you just want to buy a specific weekend, you can do that. Um, and actually this weekend I'm part of the, the content that's lined up. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, I'm doing a reading of Edgar Allan Poe's, uh, mask of the red death, uh, along with a, uh, kind of about a half hour intro with some information about kind of the history of pandemics. Uh, some of, uh, some short biographical, uh, biography on uh, Edgar Allan Poe and kind of how those two things came together for Mask of the Red Death. And then I'll, I'll do a reading. Um, you know, it should be pretty cool. Um, and uh, you know, a couple people have uh, have heard it so far or seen it and they, they seem to have enjoyed it. So if you're uh, looking for, for something to check out for some content at Salem Bar, I definitely recommend it because uh, it's me and I think I did a good job. Yeah. Check it out. And very timely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, m- more now than maybe when it was first announced, especially. And, and you know what, too? And Mask of the Red Death, I think, came out on Shudder. So it's like it's perfect timing. Um, but yeah. So. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, let's let's move on. We uh, like I said, we have our um, our fourth and final um, pick at the drive in and our movie at the drive in. It's it's late, you know. I mean, again, like we're at, you know, if, if at the drive-ins I go to, if we're at movie four, you know, we're at like two o'clock in the morning because every movie is going to, even if the movie's an hour and a half, it's going to be about two hours because you got the break time, you got the trailers, you got if they do any programming in between. So yeah, we're at, we're around two o'clock. So people are falling asleep. Um, you know, some people are, are forced, are holding their eyelids open um, and, uh so for too good to be uh, true, we have uh, we've had Gremlins two, we've had Predator two, we have Pet Cemetery two. Um, what are you ending it with, Brian? So they, this is exactly what I'm thinking with my pick. People are getting pretty loopy. Um, they've just been through you know something of a downer of a movie. Uh, so we need something that's just going to go a little bit bonkers. And I don't think you can get much more bonkers than Slumber Party Massacre Part two. Um, for those who are familiar with the series, uh, who are familiar with the first one, especially, um, you know, from uh, Amy Holden Jones, it's kind of known as uh, a, a slasher that was written and directed by women and kind of leaned into the silliness and kind of the, the stereotypical tropiness of the, the, the different slasher tropes. Um, you know, it, it was also like, it stayed kind of low key and that it wasn't going too over the top in its silliness. Uh, it just kind of like, it was aware of 
the way slashers are um, and just kind of leaned into that. Um, when writer and director Deborah Brock took over for the second one, uh, she just decided to go absolutely batshit crazy. And <laughs> she turned it into a weird, nightmarish, greaser 50s musical where the uh, the killer from the first one, uh, who uh, his kind of his, his weapon of choice is a drill, uh, he's come back with supernatural powers uh, that include um, a leather jacket, uh, greased back hair and his drill is now connected to a, an electric guitar. And this movie is just so out of its mind. You can't help but love it. Like it, it would, it would fit in well with, um, uh, Tamika with your horror musicals, because there is like, there are musical breaks in this movie, several of them where the killer just goes into a full song and dance routine. Um, and it features uh, an interesting cast. Uh, our, our final girl is played by Crystal Bernard, who uh, you might actually know as Helen, the lunch counter lady from uh, Wings, the uh, the 90s uh, uh, sitcom. Um, it's also got uh, – what is her name? I um, uh, can't remember Pam off the top of my head what her Pam name is, but you. it is uh, Robin uh, – Juliet Cummins, uh, mm. who, who you might know as Robin from Friday the 13th Part 5. Um, she was also in um, – uh, Psycho 3. Uh, also Heidi Kozak, who you might know from Friday the 13th Part 7. So there's definitely some nice, uh, you know, bringing in of uh, some some Friday the 13th franchise folks. Um, and it's just like this movie is just so bonkers and so over the top. Um, I only saw it probably within the last year or so for the first time, um, and I instantly fell in love with it. Uh, it's, uh, it's streaming on Shutter right now, um, but I, I do think that it would be a great one to just cap off a, a night of of sequels uh at uh, at my drive-in i love it so much you are right i <laughs> i i uh this it would fit i think well with just like some of the best horror musicals like the it's just again bizarre it's my favorite word of the evening <laughs> just love it love it so much this movie is incredible <laughs> this I, one this is an excellent way to end a drive-in because you end it on such a high note. Mm -hmm. People are feeling good. People are actually awake. People can actually drive home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is a movie that everybody needs to see this. I had a friend of mine who I program 31 days of horror movies for him. And I've been doing it for a few years now. But he still always talks about how much he loved Slumber Party Massacre 2. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be a yearly watch for him now after having seen it a year or two ago. Um, and it, it's, it, this is a great one. And a lot of people may sleep on this because, you know, you're like, oh, well, you know, the, the first one was, was good, but, you know, it, it, it's not, to me, it's not a, a great movie, or at least I wouldn't expect the sequel to go in such a different direction or be significantly better, in my opinion. And um, yeah, if you haven't seen it, you got to watch it. Wait, did we didn't we watch this all together on Zoom? We did. We did. We did. We did. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was your first time seeing it. M me? Us? It wasn't. I I, 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 no, no, no. That no, wasn't no. my first time. Yeah. I, I um, it was um, it popped up randomly on one of uh, Shutter's like you know they have those uh, the kind of constantly streaming uh, the the three stream channels. I think it was on like it's uh, the yeah. the Slashix. Uh, channel. Um, and I was just immediately sucked in. That was a good watch. I love that. We watched that together. It's a good memory. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that's a great one uh, and a great way to end your drive in. So, um, let's move on to Derek and, um, you know, Derek were, I wish I were, no, I do remember. I have it here. It's Oktoberfest. It's feels like fall and it's fall fling. Depending on where you're having <laughs> your drive-in or your version of this drive-in, use whichever one you feel more comfortable with. And so um, people saw Hocus Pocus and Halloween 4 and Trick or Treat. What is the state of your drive-in and your patrons at this point? And what is your fourth movie? Well, by this point, they're feeling a little sleepy. Although I, th I think 
energy wise, it's, you know, they should be on a little bit of a sugar rush from trick or treat. They just saw Sam running amok and dealing out Halloween vengeance. So I feel like maybe even if they are a little tired, they're gonna have a little bit of an energy surge coming into the fourth movie. And because it's super late, it's super late into the night and their mind might be playing tricks on them. They're kind of in this half awake state. And I think it's the perfect time to play what I think is like the ultimate fall horror movie. And that is the Blair Witch Project. And nothing feels more fall to me than this movie, just because it's almost entirely in the woods. It just has, I don't know, it just feels like you're fully immersed in the woods in the fall and the crunch of the leaves and the barrenness of it. Everything just kind of comes together in this big melting pot where I feel like it just exemplifies the spookiness of the season. And I think it's, it's one of those movies where you're either, it seems like it's so polarizing even today where you either love it and you totally buy into it or you just hate it. And you're like, no, this isn't scary at all. So I feel like the later you play this at night, the better, because I think people have more of an open mind to the, the horror of it and the simplicity of it and the, the creepiness of what you don't see. So I feel like this would be the perfect way to end the movie or end the movie marathon and just kind of give everyone something to think about or creep them out a little bit at the very end. And I know some people might fall asleep because it is a little more of a slow burn, but I think it's worth taking that risk because I think the horror works better in that movie, the later at night, kind of like the shining or paranormal activity. I think the later you watch this movie, the creepier it is. And it's going to make you just want to go maybe take a walk in the woods uh, around fall time or maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Derek, isn't it going to have like the exact opposite effect if it's, uh, no. if it's doing its job, <laughs> I guess, I guess uh, maybe like take a walk on the edge of the woods in, our, <laughs> in fall time, but <laughs> maybe look at a picture of some woods. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, from a distance, but you know, it, it, it's, it's it it's like it takes place in October. It has that I don't know. It just it feels like fully immersed in the nature of fall. And I feel like like so few movies fully take advantage of it the way that Blair Witch Project did. And yeah, so I, I feel like it's kind of a gamble. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with it as my final movie marathon entry. Oh. Sounds good. Yeah, that's a creepy one. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, I think especially because people are like between like halfway between, you know, being asleep and awake and, you know, mine might start playing tricks on them. So yeah, it's a good one. Um, so we're going to move right on to Mika. Your theme is horror musicals. And, um, you know, we had the nightmare before Christmas and repo and Sweeney Todd. And so what's the state of your audience and, um, what's your final pick? I think they're either depressed by all of the um, human burgers or they're super pumped. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping for. Because either way, Rocky Horror Picture Show, I think would be perfect for, you know, either mood. You I know? was hoping that's how you were going to end it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, is there any other way to end a horror musical lineup? Right? I mean, you're ending with a party. Yeah, exactly. Do the time warp, you know? Maybe do the time warp back to the beginning of the drive through. I mean, drive through, <laughs> the drive in, <laughs> you know, marathon, start it all over again. Um, you know, hang out with some fun, weird characters that have, you know, uh, they have pizzazz. You could say, one could say. Um, and again, you know, very few of the songs are terrible. I think that's really important. I, I, I think that in order to keep people engaged, the, most of the songs have to hit, you know? You can't have a really good one in the beginning and then like an eh song and then end off, you know, really well. They ha it, there's got to be like a level of consistency so that's definitely true of Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
And I think it might even kind of fit with no, I totally would. It totally I feel like I'm working this out as <laughs> as I'm speaking. But it it could be kind of like a a midnight situation where you could like throw things at the school. Maybe not that. Maybe that's not. They can throw things towards the screen though. Yeah. I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, well, you could do that at my drive-in. If I owned the drive-in, you could throw things at the screen. I, I don't know how that goes um, with other people's drive-ins. But yeah, you know, you can come in costume. You could throw things. You could yell things. All the interactive fun. Um, yeah. And then I, d- I think you would definitely be able to drive home because how could you not wake up? Once time warp hits. No, everybody's going to be awake for that one. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is an energy uplifter. I mean, you can't be tired by the time that movie ends. And it's the ultimate midnight movie, too. So it just works on so many levels. It's the perfect time to play it. It's a perfect venue. People are dancing on top of cars instead of in the movie theater aisles. But it all works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I actually remember the first time I saw it, I was a kid who hadn't yet grasped the concept of camp. So, like, I'm expecting, like, a straightforward horror movie. And, like, as I'm seeing, you know, Tim Curry, you know, dressed up as a, you know, transvestite from transsexual Transylvania, I'm just not getting any of it. Um, And so, like, I was just bored. I just didn't, you know, it it went right over my head. And then I just happened to give it a rewatch, probably, I don't know, my late 20s, early 30s. And I was just like, oh, I 100% get this now. This is amazing. I, I get that. I mean, like, if you watched it as a child... You might not, because there's a lot of adult humor, you know, Mm -hmm. in the film as well. I can get not understanding, like a lot of that going over your head. Yeah, it took me a little time to warm up to this, but now I karaoke science fiction double feature. So, Mm. you know, I've converted. So good. That one's so good. It's it's a great one. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, thank you for your, uh, for your drive-in experience. This is, uh. This is another good one. And um, so, yeah, so I'm going to close mine out with um, I'm not going to say what it is yet, because I got to tell you what the what the experience has been so far. So we're we're invasion. Um, we're, we're invasion of, of aliens, of otherworldly beings. Um, we had critters. We had life force. We put on I married a monster from outer space. And I'm hoping. Unlike. Most cases, I'm hoping that you're in a car there's four of you, and maybe one or two of you has fallen asleep, or maybe one of you just keeps nodding and, you know, just wakes up, and maybe just enough to, like, fall asleep, because my pick is uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 78, mm-hmm. and uh, I will say that you can alternate this. I I used to always go with the 56 version. It's excellent. It's a masterpiece. I know there are some people who think that 78's better. I I like them both differently or for different ways. But, um, you know, you you go with whatever one you want at my drive in. I'm going to go with 78 because I feel like this one's a little bit more hypnotic, a little more scary. And obviously the big difference between the two movies is it's ending. And I want to end with this one in particular. Um, these movies, I, I mean, like I said, either one of them are all time great science fiction because, you know, similar to what I had mentioned with, um, you know, I married a monster from outer space. And again, remember invasion of the body snatchers was first. It was like, you are not the person that I thought you knew or that I thought I knew. And that can translate to so many in so many different ways. Um, you know, people had mentioned that, that, you know, they could see the correlation between, um, you know, the original invasion of the body snatchers and the communist scare. But when they talked to the, the filmmakers back in the uh, back in the day, they had said, well, we didn't really have a political agenda with it. And, and even if that and if that is true or even if it isn't, it shows how 
how timeless this concept is that you can apply it to anything that there, you know, you're worried that, you know, your loved ones have changed for some reason, or you're worried that the world around you has changed. Um, you know, I mean, look at, look at the world right now. And, um, you know, because of, you know, the, the, the way the world is with both COVID and the political situation, there are people that are like, you know, I, I, like people seem like aliens. That's how different they think from, from, from other people. And, um, you know, and, and very rarely will you find a family that completely agrees on anything. So I think this movie continues to be just as timely now as it was in, in 56 or 78, um, and so I think for, for that reason, you know, for me, it really works as like, like I said, from a, a deeper level, this movie will, will always be watchable, but at my drive in, I want to scare the crap out of you. And so I want some of you to fall asleep and then I want you to drive home and I want you to be like, is that person in the back of my car really, you know, my, 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 you know, family member, my girlfriend or my wife or my husband, or are they an alien? And, um, it, it's terrifying. And I will say, you know, that I have, interestingly enough, cause I watched this movie when I was really little and I have had recurring dreams, invasion of the body snatcher dreams. It might be like once a year or once every few years, but like regular, and they're not necessarily nightmares, but they are where like, I need to stay awake or like I'm on top of a hill and I'm like, I'm watching like the pods being loaded into, you know, farmed or being loaded into trucks and, um, this movie has stuck with me like almost my entire life. It's it's a great movie. Both of them are. And seven, but Invasion of the Body Snatchers is actually one that um, I didn't see for a very long time. Um, I haven't seen the 56 version, um, but I did finally see the 78 version uh, in the, again, it's fairly recently, well, like within the last year or so. And I think what stuck with me about that movie and it is an absolute like it's just an amazing movie the the way it captures the loneliness of the situation of the, you know these people who are just like getting more and more isolated from people that they think they can trust until it's down to just like one or even none um and it's just such a like it's scary, but it's also just so sad. Um, and and Jonathan, I think you know you're really kind of hitting the nail on the head on like how many people must be feeling like that right now. Um, you know, I consider myself very fortunate to be surrounded by people who look at the current political climate and you know the the current leadership and you know recognize just kind of how crazy and wrong it is but to be like that one kind of dissenting voice of reason in a family that just completely like drank the kool-aid must be such an awful feeling and probably similar to what's being conveyed in invasion of the body snatchers so it's um like you said it's such a relevant movie and i think part of why it works so well is because exactly like you said, like it's that, that feeling of loneliness and feeling of isolation um, and, and feeling like the people around you have changed. It doesn't like it, it fits for this scenario, but like it doesn't have to just be this scenario. Um, yeah. It's just, it's an amazing movie. And um, I, for one would totally be the person who would a probably have fallen asleep between like midnight and two and would definitely play with the idea of like, if, if I sense someone was like feeling a little on edge, I would definitely point at them while like screeching in this high pitched uh, squall. So yeah, I would definitely be that guy. <laughs> I have done that to people at some point. I have a, I have the good screech down, the full mouth open, and the point. I'm not doing it on here because I, I want to protect everybody's ears. But one day, Can, did you at least consider uh, including 2007's The Invasion? I just have to be that guy. But no, that wasn't even a consideration. No, because you keep referencing the 50s one and the 70s one, but I'm like, no love for 07. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Just had to put it out there. But no, that's that's a great pick. And probably the most, maybe the most haunting image you could end a movie marathon on. I think that that's pretty awesome. And yeah. what a cast, too. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the seven, the, 
78 one, I believe is the only, no, no, no. I have seen the invasion, but I realized that we're not speaking of, of her. So <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's also a uh, body snatchers and that the one on the military base. And there's like, I think there's another one too. There's like another, like, I don't know if it's a TV one or like they didn't call it that. I think there was a TV invasion of the body snatchers as well. Yeah, I've heard. There's, I, I think it's from like 93. Like there's one that uh, I've heard is like the, it's kind of got a bit of a cult following. You know, people think it uh, – some people tend to think it's underrated. I haven't seen it in so long. It, it might be a good movie, but I just – I haven't yeah, I haven't seen it since I was little. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But uh, – but yeah, so thank you, um, you know, to to my co-hosts for putting together such awesome uh, movie marathons, and um, you know, thank you to uh, our listeners. You know, we are always uh, very appreciative for your your help and support, um, and uh, hopefully that we have some movie picks and some some marathons that you'll check out. If you do, um, please do let us know on social media and. Um, you know, and, uh, or, or email us. Uh, as always, we want to thank Brian, our engineer for helping us out each and every episode. And of course, you know, we want to thank our corpse club members, um, who help support us. If you are interested in joining the corpse club, you can go to corpseclub.com and, uh, you can find out how to become a member. We've got a membership card, uh, a t-shirt, you got different membership options. You can uh, request an episode topic. Um, don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Every rating and review really helps. You can also find us on um, SoundCloud, Spotify. We're on Amazon now. And uh, all of your other favorite podcast providers. If you want to get in touch, reach out anytime. We're at contact at corpseclub.com. On Twitter, we're at Daily Dead News and at Corpse Club. And we're on Instagram and Facebook under Corpse Club as well. Thanks again for listening. Um, We hope everyone stays safe and stays healthy, stays sane, and most of all, stay scary. (laughs) 